I now declare open the third day of the 11th session of the assembly of the International Renewable Energy Agency. My name is R.K. Singh, and I am the Minister for New and Renewable Energy of India. The President has invited me to preside over the Assembly's deliberations for this ministerial meeting. It is an honor for me to be here with all of you today as we have discussions on agenda item number eight, a ministerial plenary meeting on renewables and pathways to carbon neutrality, innovation, green hydrogen, and socioeconomic policies. I would like to warmly welcome all the delegations present. I would also like to extend a welcome to the Director General of IRENA, Mr. Francisco La Camera, and our keynote speakers, Mrs. Kadri Simon, Ms. Kadri Simpson, the Energy Commissioner at the European Commission, Mr. Fateh Birol, the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, and Mr. Francisco Starache, the CEO of NL. I would also like to welcome our moderators, Ms. Lawrence Tubiana, the CEO of the European Climate Foundation, and Mr. Kirsten Sash, the Director General at the Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature Conservation, Building, and Nuclear Safety of Germany, and also the distinguished members of our panel. The Assembly has before it a background note with the same title contained in document A-11, slash BN slash four. To focus our discussions, we shall hear opening remarks by the Director General on this important issue, as well as remarks from our keynote speakers. This will then be followed by a panel discussion moderated by Ms. Null Lawrence Tubiana and Mr. Kirsten Schack. I now invite the Director General for his introductory remarks. Director General, you have the floor. Thank you, dear Vice President and dear friend. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you all to this ministerial discussion of renewables and the pathway to carbon neutrality. The signs on climate change tell us that we have no time to waste to contain the climate emergency. It was heartening to see the growing momentum on, on net zero strategy even in the middle of the pandemic. There are now over 30 countries and the EU with commitment to a net zero goal. In addition, an increasing number of subnational regions, cities and companies are committing to net zero emission. I know from my discussion with many of you that a wide range of other, range of other countries are also reviewing their objectives and looking for advice on what can be done. Reaching net zero across all sectors of the economy by mid century is a massive undertaking. Unparalleled changes across all parts of the energy sector needs to be realized simultaneously. Thanks to the huge stride made in the last decade on renewables, for some sector, the choice are relatively clear. Renewables are now cost competitive and can deliver most of the reduction needed in power systems. For other sectors, such long haul transport and heavy industry, uncertainty remain around the optimal pathway. But key building blocks are crystallizing. Renewables must and can play a critical role in all sectors. Electrification with renewables will be the principal route to deep emission reductions. But we also need to better understand how to produce and best use the green hydrogen and sustainable biomass. There are no challenges countries acting alone can solve. Sectors such as aviation and shipping will require cross-border solutions. Industrial sectors such as steel, cement, or petrochemicals are traded regionally and globally. And new fuels 
such as hydrogen, synthetic fuels, or biofuels will increasingly be traded between countries. A high degree of international collaboration is essential. And it is this one of the reason ARENA was created. At your request, we have been exploring how to close gaps in our collective knowledge and using our global networks to find new ways of bringing together countries and industry. Building on our extending work on developing climate safe energy scenario and informed by the insight from the ARENA publication in 2020 and key events such as our 2020 Innovation Week, the 2021 edition of our Global Renewable Outlook will this year contain a global energy roadmap consistent with the 1.5 degree goals. This means carbon neutrality by mid-century. I will also build on IRENA's long-standing work on the socioeconomic footprint of energy transitions, which also highlights the importance of a holistic approach to ensure job creation, industrial development, health, and other development priorities, as well as just transitions. In 2018, the Assembly adopted a five-year strategy for ARENA with the mission to lead the transformation of the global energy system. ARENA is assisting countries in multiple ways by supporting the development of national and regional roadmaps and strategy, by undertaking analysis, by providing platforms for the exchange of experience and by facilitating financing and action on the ground. I look forward to your feedback on the emerging priority so we can continue to provide our members with timely and targeted support. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, reaching net zero requires decisive, ambitious and sustained action. But governments now have a once in a generation opportunity to make the rapid shift as we recover from the COVID pandemic. Looking back at the progress achieved with renewables in the last decades, give me hope. Together, we can recover better and build a sustainable energy system that support the resilient, equitable, and prosperous economies and society. As Kadri say, in occasion of our first day of the day of energy transition, it's not that we have to build back better. We have to build different. And I'm pleased that I have several distinguished speakers with us to set the scene for the discussion. My dear friends, you Commissioner Kadri Simpson, IA Executive Director Fatih Birol, and NLCO Francesco Starace, and the President of the Assembly, Madame Teresa Ribera. And then we'll then follow by Lawrence Tobiana, CEO of the European Climate Fund Action, and Carter Sachs of the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, who will facilitate our panel discussion. So with our, your permission, Mr. Vice President, and before I hand back the floor to you, I'd like to show a short video. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. The Thank you, Dr. Paris Agreement commits us all to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius. To avoid the worst impacts, we must hold the rise of global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Achieving this goal will require concerted action to reduce emissions to net zero across all sectors of the economy. The political momentum is growing. Over 30 countries and the European Union have already declared net zero emissions policy goals. Renewables are the backbone of this transformation and could deliver two thirds of the emission reductions needed whilst generating sustainable growth and creating millions of new jobs. And renewables affordability provides new options to decarbonize challenging sectors such as transport and industry. Renewable electricity will play a critical role, but we also need renewable fuels like green hydrogen and sustainable biomass. Global decarbonization will require strong cooperation across countries and industries. 
IRENA was created with this agenda in mind. Its global reach, cutting-edge knowledge and inclusive platform can help us achieve our shared goals. Thank you, Dr. General, for your remarks and for this informative video. I now invite Ms. Kadri Simpson to deliver her keynote address. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you, ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The future is screen or not at all. This is a phrase we keep in our minds at the European Commission when it comes to energy policy. Uh, our aim is for that uh, future to look like the first climate neutral continent by 2050, a reduction of at least 55% of emissions by 2030, um, 38 to 40% of renewables by 2030 from the current 32% level, and it looks like fully phasing out coal. Um, these reference points give a clear picture of our destination. And today I want to explain how we plan to get on getting there. Uh, first, uh, we know that the increase in renewables that we need to obtain is enormous. In all sectors, we, we are talking about at least doubling renewable energy sources. By 2030, this is just nine years from now, the electricity sector will see the highest share of renewables with over 60% in the scenarios we are looking at. By 2050, just one generation from now, renewables in power generation are projected to be more than 85%. And these are leaps that the energy system has never seen before. To make them a reality, wind energy needs to grow from 210 gigawatts today to about 430 gigawatts in 2030, and then almost triple to 1,200 gigawatts by 2050. Solar PV is at 131 gigawatts today, and that needs to more than double to uh, 320 gigawatts during this decade, and then triple again by 2050. Here we have, of course, um, um, course for cautious optimism. EU member states installed 18.2 gigawatts of solar power capacity in 2020, um, an 11% improvement over the 16.2 gigawatts deployed in the previous year, despite the pandemic. That makes 2020 the second best year ever for solar in the European Union. Um, for those areas, we see optimism. We also see areas of concern. The share of renewables in heating and cooling sector is an example of where progress is moving too slowly. It is crucial to accelerate, and they need to increase um, to 39% uh, by 2030. Huge leaps require huge action, some of uh, which we have already begun. Last year, we, we adopted the strategies on hydrogen, energy system integration, offshore renewable energy, the, uh, the renovation wave and a revision of the EU main energy infrastructure planning for projects of common interest, the Trans-European Network for Energy. Right now, we are speeding up to reviewing all our legislation in all sectors of energy and climate action, and we'll present proposals in June so that all aspects of our work will be, as we say, fit for 55. But I have described so far is a matter of advancing the tools already in our toolbox. But uh, success also means um, evolving in new ways altogether. Renewable hydrogen is a big part of the evolution. That's why we made it um, the very first big initiative of this mandate when we launched our hydrogen strategy last July. And renewable hydrogen is also an investment. Our experts have estimated that every billion of investment that we are able to attract in the renewable hydrogen will create 10,000 jobs along the supply chain. And we aim to go from mostly fossil fuel based hydrogen at this moment to 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen in a single decade. And from less than 2% today to 13 to 14% of clean hydrogen in our energy mix by 2050. Again, this is a huge leap not only in thinking, but also in how our energy system functions. And uh, we first need to scale up supply and demand for hydrogen. 
On the supply side, our most urgent need is electrolyzers with peak capacities. Many are already in the works. Last summer, I visited Cologne, uh, where the world's largest PEM hydrogen electrolysis plant using only renewable electricity is being built. Um, this is big, but we need to go even bigger. Um, last uh, year, we launched a call for a 100 megawatt electrolyzer as part of the European Green Deal call under Horizon 2020. On the demand side, we will work on common standards, certifications and terminology while piloting a carbon contracts for different programs for the use of clean hydrogen in steel and chemicals production. Boosting uh, the supply and demand for hydrogen only makes sense if it is based on a solid market and infrastructure. And we need to shape an open and competitive market with um, unhindered cross-border trade and uh, infrastructures to transport hydrogen to exactly where it's uh, needed. And this could mean a potential repurposing of some of our existing natural gas infrastructure and avoiding stranded assets. And so in December, we presented a revised 10E regulation to do just that. A decentralized integrated energy system of the future will have hydrogen at its core. As an energy carrier in its own right, but also for its capacity to integrate variable renewables and storage. These are our ambitions, but then follows the obvious question, what about the investment to back these ambitions up? We are looking at an annual investment increase from 2021 to 2030 of around 350 billion compared to what we invested in the decade leading up, leading up to 2020. To say that, uh, this is a challenge, um, um, but even this is understatement. Uh, but of course, this is doable. And uh, this is where the Green Deal coincides with our effort on recovery from the COVID crisis. Let me echo what I said earlier in the, in the opening panel. We are putting the green transition at the heart of our plans for recovery. Last July, European leaders agreed on an unprecedented recovery package. Our rec recovery program will be reinforced by the largest ever multi-annual budget for the European Union. Green and sustainable projects will be at the core of our investment priorities. Each national recovery plan supported by our recovery instrument will have to include at least 37% of climate-related expenditure. And uh, all other investments backed by European Union money will have to do no harm to our environment. And we want to signal to others around the globe that green energy leads to greater competitiveness. Added to that, we know that each of these pathways, continuing to boost traditional renewables and evolving to include new ones, are connected by a push towards greater innovation. We must identify the most innovative tools and processes that science and innovation can provide with us. And uh, we must do it together. That leads me to my next point. The impact in all of the areas uh, that I have mentioned today uh, will be greatly amplified by international cooperation. Why struggle alone when we could succeed together? The Green Deal is also driving our global engagement. We are pushing uh, for greater greener dialogue with all partners and engaging in multilateral fora, just as we are doing today. And all of these will help us unite our best minds to reach carbon neutrality. That extends to our relations with our partners. Many global actors are engaging and committing to ambitious climate actions. And we are looking forward to a renewed partnership with the United States as they shift their ambitions towards a climate positive agenda. For green hydrogen, we consider international cooperation essential to create a global rules-based market. For this, we should work on harmonized safety and environmental standards, but also on common certification criteria for renewable and low carbon hydrogen. The hydrogen initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial and the Mission Innovation on Clean Hydrogen are great examples of that cooperation. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, what I have outlined in a snapshot of our plans is, um, is, um, is really only a snapshot of our plans for renewables in Europe. And I like to think that um, of them as the ladder on which we will climb uh, to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And every rung on that ladder, renewable hydrogen, innovation, investment, and international cooperation is as important as the next in reaching that goal. And as we climb, we keep in our mind that uh, when it comes to energy, the future is green or not at all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Simpson, for your remarks. I now invite Mr. Fateh Birol to deliver his keynote address. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman uh, R.K. Singh. Uh, 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 Mrs. Simpson, uh, Mrs. Tarache, and uh, 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 Director General La Camera, dear Francesco, uh, greetings to all of you from uh, IEA headquarters in uh, Paris. And it's a great pleasure to join uh, this uh, excellent uh, colleagues to say a few words uh, from our perspective. The, I think the, one of the most uh, promising things that will happen this year is the very fact that the European Union, UK, Japan, Korea, Canada, uh, China, they all came up with pledges for carbon neutrality mid uh, this century. And I expect that the very soon uh, the Biden administration, if they follow up on their uh, pledges, will join this club. And as such, more than 60% of the global emissions today will be covered by those pledges. And I do expect some other countries will join to this uh, uh, group uh, very soon. This, ladies and gentlemen, will give a unprecedented political momentum to address our climate challenge. When I say climate challenge, in fact, our climate challenge is essentially an energy challenge because more than 80% of the emissions causing climate change come from the energy sector. Therefore, this is, those pledges are very important. Having said that, to have a pledge and target is something, to put in place the real policies to reach those targets is something different. This is uh, something that we have to uh, uh, keep in mind. Just to give you, I mean, to put a pledge may be easy, in court, but when you look at the numbers, what is needed is huge. Electric cars, we all talk about electric cars. When you open the newspapers, electric cars in the, in the front page. And today, as we speak, of the, all the cars sold in the world, only 3% is electric cars. This is a bit disappointing. But more disappointing in my view is 42% of all the cars sold in the world are SUVs. SUVs which are uh, emitting much more than a normal car. Huge emissions. And governments, I am always surprised, governments who are very sensitive in the uh, clean energy don't put financial instruments in place to provide this incentive for uh, SUVs. Living aside, just hi highlighting the challenge. Another challenge I wanted to highlight to you is the following. Between now and 2050, to come to net zero, we need to have huge emission reductions. And the, now is the uh, is, uh, question, the issue, for me the nerve center of all the problem. 50% of these emission reductions between now and 2050 need to come from technologies which are not in the market yet. They are not in the market. Madam Commissioner talked about hydrogen. Yes, 
Therefore, there is a need for innovation. Support the innovation, support the R&D. Without this innovation, without pushing the next energy technologies, together with digitalization, we will not be able to get these new technologies in place together with the proven ones, such as solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, energy efficiency, and uh, others. So this other point I wanted to make. Last two points. Now, this is a global problem and everybody, every nation in the world, a responsible nation should be part of the, in my view, net zero target. Having said that, we have to be fair. I cannot put a low income country, which has limited responsibilities in the cumulative emissions and which have limited means to address the challenges together with an advanced economy. We have to be fair here. So therefore, we have to build mechanisms in order to support developing nations so that they have to access the right technologies so that they are able to mobilize clean energy financing in their countries. An area that IEA is working very hard with the World Bank and the World Economic Forum to build these mechanisms. Otherwise, in my view, it wouldn't be a fair transition as we all talk about the clean energy transitions. Last point, ladies and gentlemen, we all talk about the 2050 net zero. Yes, but the world, energy world needs a roadmap. Which energy policies, how much investments, and how to finance those investments. Therefore, as we have recently announced, International Energy Agency, at the request of COP presidency, Mr. Sharma, we are preparing world's roadmap to net zero by 2050. We are going to publish it in May this year so that the world has a roadmap what the challenges are and what the opportunities are to reach net uh, zero target. And uh, this, as Mr. Sharma says, this hopefully will under, underpin a successful outcome from the historical summit of Glasgow in November. Our aim is to build a wonderful bridge, a bridge between Paris and Glasgow, which can hopefully bring a success, good news, as a result of the world's leader coming together in Glasgow in November. And in all these efforts that we are all together, countries, organizations, and companies, there is a need for working, all of us together. And I want to here thank my colleague, uh, Francesco. We have two Francescos. I thank both of them, but especially this time to La Camera, the Director General for the great work, great cooperation, uh, Irena and IEA is doing in uh, many fronts. But I also thank uh, the, all the colleagues uh, here for putting their time, efforts, and their hearts so that we, this year, this critical year, we make the necessary decisions, actions to pave the way for a better world, namely a net zero world in 2050. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the time you have given to me. Thank you, Mr. Birol, for your remarks. I now invite Mr. Francesco Starase to deliver his keynote address. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice President and um, honorable ministers, uh, dear friends, uh, dear Fatih uh, colleagues. It's an honor for me to be here and, uh, and to hear all these important contributions. Um, it is indeed uh, a very important year, 2021. It's the year of energy and it's the first of a decade in which we have seen clearly the path that uh, Commissioner Simpson has indicated to us. Uh, and this has um, been seen around the world 
notably during a 2020 marked by the pandemic. Uh, what uh, Fatih just uh, mentioned is that around the world, there is a growing trend to and, and consciousness that decarbonizing the world not only is good uh, is needed in order to combat climate change, but it is also a good idea from an economic standpoint. And this is something that today we can say, but it was not so clear 10 years ago, for example, in 2010. So this is something we have to reflect. Technology has changed drastically the power and the energy sector around the world. It will continue to do so. And uh, the trend in which uh, technology is driving us is uh, one in which the combined forces of the digital dimension in which we all increasingly live in. And I think this, <laughs> just this platform is a big example of that. And uh, the incredible strengths that uh, the science of material developments is showing around the world drive um, sources of energy uh, coming from renewable uh, sources to become more and more competitive. This will be the case in our um, assessment for the next 10, 20 years. It is true that uh, we do not have complete control from a market standpoint of the economics of the uh, solutions we need to have in the next 20 years to fully decarbonize by 2050. But it is also true that we know the direction in which technology is evolving and we can assess pretty quickly uh, the viability of solutions. This is a matter of optimism and this is something that we should keep in mind when we confront ourselves with incredible challenges that uh, we have, to, we have to, to face when we try to decarbonize our economies. Our economies are way behind in the curve. They are not there when you look at where we should be in terms of carbon reduction and, and where we should be in terms of substitution of uh, the energy mixes that we inherited from a, um, a not so distant past. But uh, the, what we have just observed even during 2020 and Commissioner Simpson was very clear in, in, uh, in showing numbers. I mean, 2020 was a record year for installation of solar PV in Europe notwithstanding an incredible crisis that the pandemic has brought about and notwithstanding delays which resulted from that. The year would have been much better without uh, COVID-19. So we have a big challenge. We have, however, technology that helps us and we have a complete alignment of the major stakeholders. What is missing here is something that has to do <clears throat> with the governance of the amplitude of the effort. And there is uh, also a missing component of this uh, transition that I constantly have to remind every time I have the chance. That is that <clears throat> this transition uh, and the um, decarbonization of our economies goes hand in hand with the progressive electrification being electricity. Pro Thank you, uh, Mr. Strache, for your remarks. I now would like to invite the Is president of the assembly. Hello? Yeah. Uh, we need to reconnect our, uh, um, and connect our um, distribution lines because the systems cannot be electrified without heavy investment in Indian connectivity across countries and across member states of the union and across geographical areas of the world. So there is an incredible amount of investment which was estimated in about $12 trillion between uh, um, the period 2020 to 2040, just to cope with this huge scope of investment on, on networks. Um, how do we do this? It is clearly a question of governance and a question of making our tools, the ones that we inherited from our decades of activity, matching the ambition of this effort. We have long-term um, authorization processes. We have extremely cumbersome um, decision-making processes. 
that needs to be need to be addressed and changed if we really want to make technology work the way it could work in our systems. And there are also parts of the world that are missing within this, uh, this effort. And I'm noting in particular Africa, that is the area of the world where we have the largest concentration of people with limited or no access to energy. Although Africa has an incredible uh, wealth of natural resources in the space of, um, of uh, renewable energy. We believe that we have to partner up with public and private um, uh, schemes. And to that end, uh, we as Enel have launched a platform which we called Renew Africa in order to align all the stakeholders at European, African and world level that want to contribute to make the renewable energy penetration of Africa a real success story and not just another failed attempt. We need to de-risk some of the uh, perceptions that exist in the investor base. And that can be done. There are examples of success uh, that uh, we had experienced, provided that most of the African countries understand that uh, they need to address legal and regulatory framework basically in order to de-risk the potential uh, risk profile of the country. It's a big opportunity for me to say this in this, uh, in this forum because I know that many African leaders are listening and I think it's a big opportunity for them to look into Renew Africa and see how can they can contribute to speed up the electrification and the energy access of their countries across the continent. Um, as Enel, we are committed to this. We have a 10 years plan that invests 190 billion, dollars, uh, billion euros in this transition. It's a big amount of money. Uh, we have been able to, so far, to tap uh, investors based on a new uh, tool that we launched that are bonds li linked to sustainable development gold object objectives. And this is another reason for hope. Finance needs to have sustainable development goals attached to the uh, financial instruments because they substantially reduce the risk of companies and, and, and countries that issues these bonds. I believe this is another reason of hope because we see the financial world moving out of a carbon intensive and risky business that we have been looking at in the last decades into a less risky and less uh, and more sustainable uh, investment theme that is renewable energy around the world. Thank you for your attention. And I give back the, the word to the Vice President. Thank you. President of the Assembly, Her Excellency, Mrs. Teresa Rivera, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Government of Spain and the Minister for Ecological Transition and Demographic Change with us, welcome. We welcome you. You have been presiding over our deliberations with great panache and skill. I would like to now invite you, Your Excellency, to make a brief remark on the topic. Excellency, you have the floor. Dear Excellency Minister Shing, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your moderation and your work and for your kind words to introduce this session, which is a very important session with different key players in a tricky, thrilling, exciting, inspiring uh, discussion, probably on one of the most relevant points where we identify how difficult and how broad is the type of um, issues we have in front of us in order to ensure the success of our transformation. So thank you so much to the three keynote speakers and to all the panelists without forgetting uh, to thank uh, the moderator, uh, Laurence Tubiana, who is at the very origin of the idea of building deep decarbonization pathways in order to facilitate the full decarbonization of our economies, trying to figure out what are the type of challenges and opportunities and barriers that would allow, would impede, or good difficult to achieve uh, this goal. I think that probably this idea of um, climate uh, safety, climate um, uh, 
commitment around the 1.5 degrees Celsius is one of the most interesting uh, drivers for the change we have in front of us. And trying to figure out the role of the energy system in order to deliver is one of the most, as I say, thrilling ones. The momentum uh, behind this goal has been growing steadily along the last years, the last months, and much in particular from now onwards. We know that there are many countries in different corners of the world committing and expressing their engagement towards this um, climate neutrality uh, around mid, the mid-century uh, or uh, even a, a little bit later, but understanding how important it is to figure, to uh, share uh, the targets uh, in a certain point uh, of the agenda. So to identify how and uh, where this um, uh, resulted, this, uh, this result uh, being oriented around climate uh, is going to orientate our decisions. Uh, China, Japan, uh, the European Union, many countries in different continents, Asia, Latin America, have expressed their willingness to up uh, raise their engagement towards uh, the climate goals and to work in identification of these pathways to facilitate the um, CO2 neutrality. The European Union um, is uh, committed to this net zero goal with a strong engagement from the European Council, but also understanding that uh, we need to work with many other players, as you have already said. Uh, in the different interventions. So private players, national players, local players taking their share in the responsibility to achieve this, this net zero emissions all over the world and joining forces in a positive, optimistic, constructive alliance all over the world. The scientific consensus is there. How to achieve the climate neutrality by the mid-century is not easy, but it is there. We know that there are traditional technologies that can help to achieve this goal in the energy system. And we have innovative technologies and systems appearing in the last year, showing us the pathway to a climate neutral, 100% renewable efficient future. This is um, not easy. And we need to start from um, now on these innovative approaches too. So combining what it has been proved to succeed, but also how we can go beyond what it succeeds today in order to facilitate what we need the day after tomorrow. Uh, and the Commissioner Simpson expressed something which I think is very important. The green hydrogen as part of the solution for that share that we don't know yet how to solve with the current technologies, the energy storage, the combination of decentralized and digitalized energy systems needs uh, from a broader support all over the world. I think that building together, understanding that uh, there are many very interesting initiatives coming from the scratch uh, all over the world can um, allow us uh, to build this new partnership. And um, this, uh, this could be important if we want to accelerate uh, this transformation and we need to accelerate this transformation. All these pieces uh, show to what extent the questions dealing with finance, the questions dealing with uh, technicalities, the questions dealing with um, the connection of the different pieces and the cooperation are important, but it's not just a technical or a financial issue. It is also a question of policy, it is a question of governance, it is a question of values. The human factor also facilitates or dificultates what we need to do. And in each and every country, we know that there may be some modulators, some priorities that need to be taken into account in order to succeed. The claims, the willingness to ensure prosperity, to respond to the expectations of the society, the different background that we need to facilitate in order to phase out what it is not useful anymore, but to, with a recognition for those that have been contributing for decades um, towards the uh, prosperity of our countries, the values coming from people and from the youth, the risk being assessed by the different players, the health, the industry, the employment are key 
factors in order to ensure success. It's not just a combination of electrons, it's much more complicated. So trying to combine our uh, green materials, <laughs> our green neurons uh, from the very different institutions that are being represented in this panel will help us to show and to understand where there may be additional opportunities to improve uh, this um, this exercise, this uh, this uh, this endeavor, um, and I think that um, from this discussion we can get a much more of the flavor of uh, what is already in the horizon and what are the things that we still need to strengthen. Working, of course, on the basis of uh, the good work of our colleagues uh, Francesco, in this case La Camara, also Starace, but in this case La Camara, as Fatih was saying or Mr. Patti Virol from the International Energy Agency as uh, key players in order to provide some interesting inputs on how we can combine this full decarbonization of the energy systems as soon as possible at the lowest cost and maximizing the opportunities ahead of us. Thank you so much. And um, with uh, this being said, I would like to invite uh, our dear friend, Mrs. Laurence Tubiana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation, former France Climate Change Ambassador and Special Representative for the 2015 COP21. So one of um, the key players in this successful story of the Paris Agreement. Laurence, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. And I can say how energized I am after such incredible introduction. You know, we have been really struggling the last five years after Paris. It was not always easy. Uh, the combat for really climate action uh, was not facilitated by the geopolitical context. But now we are in a period where, of course, optimism is coming back and this reflect into your absolutely consistent interventions that all our key uh, pan key note speakers have produced. And so I, I can say, uh, as Teresa Rivera said, um, I, I was really keen to see a long-term strategy net zero uh, in Paris Agreement, that's good, but now if the implementation challenge, and, and I'm really very reassured for why I um, sort of listen to. We really, I think, uh, as all of you said, so I don't need to repeat, and, and the essential part of this panel is to hear our key ministers who are hands-on on the really putting their country on the safe path for clean and secure energy and a competitive and, and cheap energy mix. Uh, and that will be certainly a fascinating discussion. Uh, I do think that what is really, uh, really, really important, now we, we have a convergence to see net zero as an anchor of the energy strategies. And as you have all said, energy strategy are at the core of this transformation because we need to electrify uh, most of the economy, the, the form in which um, the economy consumes energy. Uh, but this uh, electrification has to be really clean. And because of the constraint we are facing, because we are, I was optimistic, but I am optimistic, but we are running late. And because we are running late, of course, we have constrained by the constrained by the carbon budget, constrained by what the scientific community is telling us. And then we need to, uh, of course, we need to get these net zeros at the first, absolutely anchored at the first step. But we need now to know where we go, and that's where I enormously appreciate, as Minister Teresa Rivera said, how the institutions are coming together to design both at the European Commission level, at national level, at IEA level, at ARENA, how this, we have a consistent reference of the roadmap to get there. And this is really important, how we get there and how, which is as important, how we bridge the short term to this long-term roadmap. So what are the projects and the prospects for the next five years? So how we make this commitment real, how we ensure social cohesion around this trajectories has changed, how we deal with this just recovery from COVID crisis. Uh, I appreciate Francisco La Camera saying it's not, we don't have to be back, build back better, but build back be different. And that is really, really central. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Simpson has said very much, what, and I should not repeat that, but it's really important to realize that 
55% net zero means that we have to accelerate enormously the deployment of renewable energy in, in, in EU across the continent. And we are running late, so we have to accelerate. And we cannot allow ourselves to think that gas will be uh, the transition to cap to because of, again, the constraint of the carbon budget. So we are in a tight constraint, but there is a lot of positive thinking, innovation, now a, a conjunction right, with no, industry yes, 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 and, okay. and, and political actors. Uh, we, we need, of course, this, this strategic change in technology. Yeah. And now we, we may need to have, in a way, a push to vis-a-vis, -vis, particular the new US president who have said power should be clean by 2035. And it could be a good target for many countries, many developed countries in particular. So can we put that as a reference? <coughs> can we make sure that we really get out of the fossil fuel in the mix in time? Uh, and of course, being cautious about unsustainable solution on bioenergy, because we have to really take care of biodiversity uh, as well. So, and uh, at the end of the day as well, it's about social change, it's about job, it's about local impacts, and dealing with the stranded assets that the fossil fuel economy is representing. So we have to have this very across the economy thinking, and that's why I think the, all the ministers have a quite tough job to achieve. So after these very short remarks, and again, thanking you to give me the opportunity of listening to all of you, I would like to introduce our first uh, four panelists. Um, His Excellency uh, Seamus O'Regan, the Minister uh, of Natural Resources in Canada. Uh, His Excellency Aziz Rabba, Minister of Energy, Mines and Environment of Morocco. His Excellency Amani Abu Zaid, the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy uh, of African Union Commission, and Mr. Sorton Erdan, Director General on Energy Policy Germany. I would like you to give us a sort of first sort of three minutes introduction and then come back to you to question. So Minister, His Excellency, Mr. Reagan, please. Thank you, Laurence. Uh, make sure I'm on, my mic is good. Yes, it is. Thank you, Laurence, il est bon de vous revoir. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me to, or allowing me to join you today. A lot of things have changed. Um, this assembly is a little different today. It also comes at the end of a year that all of us are happy to put behind us. A year that exposed deep divisions in our society that challenged and hurt businesses, workers, communities, whole industries. So as we work together to protect and vaccinate our populations and rebuild our economies, we must keep supporting workers and businesses and keep fighting climate change. Combating climate change is the challenge and the opportunity of our post-COVID recovery. There's no question about the need to address this threat. The only question is how. How do we meet our needs? How do we power our cities, power our towns, heat our homes, grow our economy while lowering emissions? These, these questions are difficult, but they are ones that we need to answer. For Canada, the work is already underway. It starts with building our clean energy future, not just to combat a changing climate, but to ensure our energy security, strengthen our economic competitiveness, and create good, sustainable jobs for Canadians. The markets are changing. Investors from around the world are increasingly making clear choices. They're, they're putting their money into businesses, industries, and jurisdictions that are taking meaningful climate action. And they're divesting from those that, in their view, are not. So let's harness that momentum, that momentum of the marketplace now that it's responding so that we can create a more sustainable and more prosperous future for our planet, for our fellow citizens, for our children and our grandchildren, which is why we're here. In Canada, we've just unveiled an ambitious new chapter to our climate plan. It's the most robust climate strategy in our nation's history, aimed at not just meeting, but beating our 2030 Paris targets and becoming a net zero nation within three decades. To get there, we're more than tripling the price that we put on pollution over the next 10 years, phasing out coal-fired electricity by the end of this decade, and injecting an initial $15 billion to support the things that we need to achieve a net zero future, including new sources of clean energy, which are the fastest growing form of power generation in Canada, 
new solar, wind, and biomass installations in more than 100 remote and indigenous communities to reduce their reliance on diesel fuel, a national action plan for small modular reactors, a national strategy for hydrogen, the completion of our first geothermal project, the advancement of tidal power, and more hydropower here where I am in Atlantic Canada that will take this entire region off of coal. We're also helping to fund retrofits so that our people's homes and buildings are not just more comfortable, but they're more affordable to power. Advancing industrial decarbonization, supporting zero emission vehicles and the necessary charging and fueling stations, electrifying our gas sector and adopting nature-based solutions like planting 2 billion trees, putting our planet's own lungs to work for a cleaner future. And as we use the power of innovation and the fight against climate change as the springboard for our recovery, we must ensure that we've learned the lessons of a pandemic that has exposed the vulnerabilities in our societies. A century of clean growth that fails to take account of these vulnerabilities or create new ones will not meet the test of history. So, as many of you heard me say this before, no one can be left behind. Energy workers, their families, the energy producing regions of our countries here in Canada, here in my home, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, they must be included every step of the way. People must be at the center of the economic recovery. If our citizens don't feel included, they could slow down or frankly halt the momentum that we are creating here. But where they are included, that momentum to a cleaner, brighter, more prosperous future will be unstoppable. Canada sees that IRENA is central to all this. It's central to building our clean energy future, central to advancing broader socioeconomic benefits such as gender equality and inclusiveness, and central to bringing clean energy to people living without it. And we want to help lead the way. So we're finding new ways to develop new sources of energy and new technologies, as well as creating financing facilities and opportunities for the private sector to spearhead climate solutions. We want to be the world supplier of choice for clean energy. We want to be the world's leading jurisdiction for clean technology. And we want to be the first country that springs to mind when people think of energy efficiency, smart grids, or energy storage. When they think of clean hydrogen, fuel cell technologies, bioenergy, or when they talk about small modular reactors and carbon capture and storage. Combating climate change, ensuring our continued prosperity and making sure that no one is left behind. That's our common mission. And this is the group that can deliver that. I believe that. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. So thank you. Your plan and the way you display it is very, very clear and consistent. One of the big challenge you, you would cite just because of sharing the difficulties and Fatih mentioned that it's not simple. Mm. Uh, we have many challenges. So for you and for Canada, what, what is the main challenge you see and, and how much international cooperation can help you in delivering that? Of course there are domestic constraints, but as well maybe potential of international cooperation. Uh, Merci Laurence. I would say, you know, surpassing our 2030 GHG reduction targets becoming a net zero society as we have pledged to do by 2050. Uh, those are very ambitious objectives for this country with, with, and they come with some challenges. Let me focus on two of those challenges and explain how Canada intends to address them. First, I would uh, mention the need to ensure continued long-term commitment and policy action. Um, to track our progress, to ensure our success, Canada has introduced the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, which would put our net zero commitment into law and establish an independent advisory body to provide ongoing advice to the government of Canada as we chart our path to net zero by 2050. It's a commitment that sets five-year milestone targets to track our progress, uh, emission reduction plans for each milestone target, and the requirement to publish interim and final reports on the results. The second challenge I would raise is uh, specifically relevant to Canada. Uh, as a federation, many of the levers that are necessary to transition successfully to a net zero future rest with our, our subnational governments, which is our provinces and territories. Building consensus uh, and ensuring strong collaboration with our provinces and territories is absolutely essential to success in, in implementing Canada's strategy and achieving our ambitious targets. 
Um, this also means that we need to be flexible, that whatever the initiative is, whether it's carbon pricing or regulations, new programs, we always provide the flexibility for our provincial and territorial governments to adapt the implementation of these initiatives to their very specific and unique circumstances. We are the, the second largest country in the world, and, and in terms of a landmass, the world's largest democracy. So we have uh, a lot of work to do. We ha have to make sure that every corner and every part, all of these very unique parts of our big country are included in the transition, are included in lowering our emissions and achieving net zero. Merci. Canada, of course, for, as Teresa Ribeira mentioned, uh, local elements in Canada means a lot because you are just such, such a wide country with uh, so many, so many corners in a way. So if you have to look at all the corners, that, that is really a challenge. And that's really interesting, the, this, what you said about long-term consistency in policies and at the same time, the flexibility. And that, I think, is an important element, which I, we try to build in the Paris Agreement, the capacity to go for a clear direction and at the same time really trying to adapt to always changing economic conditions and uh, and he has a connection between energy transition and uh, democracy seems to be more and more important in the way every every one of you of course is, is trying to deliver the policy uh, i have first before giving the floor to his excellency aziz Rabah. Uh, the Minister of Energy and en Mines and Environment uh, of Finance of Morocco, just to apologize, present the apologies of uh, Mrs. Amani Abouzid, the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy, who has to lead for to leave for an urgent mission. So, uh, so, anyway, that leaves us uh, uh, with a uh, one less panelist, but I'm sure that will be uh, very much completed by, by the others. Can I give the floor now to? Uh, Minister Aziz Rabah, uh, and maybe understand the fantastic, of course, you have done fantastic thing on the solar energy production. That's, of course, a, sort of a world record, if I may say so. Um, what are your plans in utilizing this? And, and, you know, that was a long conversation years ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and um, being a, as a co panel co-moderator with my good friend Carsten Saar, something that Germany, of course, has discussed many, many times with North African government and in particular Morocco. How you see this idea that Morocco could be a provider of energy, not only for Morocco, but for a number of other countries, uh, how you, this is very exciting because the potential of the region is immense. You have, you are leading. Uh, and so how you see that, and, uh, and then uh, what can be done more this, I would say there is another question on hydrogen that I, I know Morocco is very keen to develop. So collaboration as Commissioner Simpson said previously seems to be very central. So I would really love to hear your views on these two elements. And again, recognizing your enormous leadership uh, in a developing country of having such an investment on solar. Thank you, Minister, if you can take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, if there is uh, any translation, I will speak in, uh, in Arabic or in French, as you like. Uh, merci beaucoup pour, uh, pour ces um, questions uh, 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 intéressantes. D'abord, je dois confirmer uh, l'engagement de mon pays pour cette dynamique internationale. Cette dynamique internationale euh, quant au changement climatique, euh, la préservation de l'environnement, le développement des énergies renouvelables, le développement de l'économie verte. Et euh, les derniers rapports qui ont été euh, publiés montrent que le Maroc, parmi les pays qui sont hautement engagés et qui réalisent des bons résultats, countries and has achieved good results. We have embarked upon a low carbon strategy. We have set up many programs. First, power generation plan 2021-2030. To reduce the need to increase 
nous solar, avons uh, préparé l'écosystème industriel, c'est-à-dire l'industrie de l'énergie, parce que nous ne suffisons pas de produire l'électricité. Ce n'est pas seulement de générer l'électricité. Au-delà de ça, il faut capter une partie de l'industrie, de cette énergie, des usines. Vous devez aussi involver l'industrie, les industries, 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 les le so cadre favorable pour acquérir des investissements en la matière. Nous avons euh, élaboré notre feuille de route hydrogène, nous avons élaboré notre feuille de route biomasse et nous avons, nous, a, nous avons commencé à élaborer And notre feuille de route concernant l'énergie marine. Donc c'est toute une, si vous voulez, une série de dynamiques qui convergent vers euh, le même objectif de faire so de notre pays un of, uh, des pays mécanismes to make our leader dans le domaine des énergies renouvelables et des énergies renouvelables. Mais nous considérons que la stabilité politique de notre pays, we consider la position géostratégique, le climat des affaires qui est en réforme climate, pour attirer des investissements nationaux et internationaux, fait que nous sommes uh, uh, capables de devenir une plateforme logistique so politique mondiale. J'ai eu l'occasion de, de proposer ça lors des différentes sessions de l'Agence internationale de l'énergie, mais aussi de l'Agence internationale de l'énergie renouvelable. Et je le confirme aujourd'hui, mon pays pourrait devenir une plateforme internationale pour sécuriser la logistique de l'énergie, toute énergie confondue, et plus particulièrement les énergies renouvelables. Donc nous sommes très contents de signer avec certains pays européens l'Open Market de l'électricité. Donc, et j'espère qu'on va aboutir à des résultats intéressants. Nous négocions avec l'Espagne pour renforcer la production électrique. Nous sommes en train de avec le Portugal. Nous avons signé avec l'Allemagne un accord pour développer les projets, que ce soit pour le marché national et le marché international. Nous sommes en train de préparer pour la markets. connexion avec des pays africains sur et nous sommes en train de préparer des stratégiques dans l'Europe et l'énergie et d'autres communautés avec pas mal de pays euh, américains, asiatiques et autres. Alors, pour terminer, je peux confirmer qu'on forme un marché qui est très ouvert. Nous avons 34 grandes entreprises internationales qui investissent au Maroc dans cinq entreprises marocaines qui viennent, euh, qui sont venues de presque 12 pays asiatiques, arabes, européens, américains et même marocains. Donc, ça veut dire que la plateforme marocaine, la plateforme à la disposition de nous sommes très contents de voir ce qu'on a bien avancé avec certains pays, partners. avec certaines entreprises, avec certaines institutions. Et donc, c'est cette dynamique qui est engagée par Sa Majesté, mise en œuvre par le gouvernement, implémentée par le ministère de l'Énergie avec tous ses partenaires. Merci, M. Mouche. Merci d'avoir choisi le français. Merci, M. le ministre. Merci d'avoir choisi le français. Ça a fait la vie plus facile pour moi. Pouvez-vous me entendre? Can you hear me? So thank you for choosing my mother tongue to better react to what you just said. It is extremely interesting to see how the economic stakeholders are also part and parcel of your national and international and regional energy policy. Congratulations for that. You didn't entirely develop on hydrogen. There's a major uh, effort in research and innovation for green hydrogen, which is a very important notion. Now for Morocco and this partnership, is that a good idea? I said that we drew up our hydrogen roadmap and we are rolling it out in a, in a program, a projects starting with the regulations that must be favorable for this and ways and means of, uh, in, of uh, encouraging national and international investments. We have noted, and this is clearly stated in the European Green Deal, that you must look for partnerships in your neighborhood, North Africa and Morocco more particularly. So we are working along those lines, investments 
in the national in our country we need green energy to be used at the national level but we believe that partnerships with our neighbors more particularly the european union will help us to create joint ventures it's all about setting up a foundation to have joint ventures between global international companies and Moroccan companies to cater to the local market and the international market. Thirdly, research. We have signed agreements with partners, a German partner in particular, but we are open. We have set up a first research platform for hydrogen, added to many other platforms in solar energy, biomass, smart buildings, and recently we launched a research platform for smart grids. So hydrogen, there is a real momentum for it. It has started. We have started to receive expressions of interest. I've met many national and international companies. Even this morning, I had a meeting with consortiums that would like to invest in producing hydrogen for exports. A part, of course, could be delivered on the national market. So all the ingredients are there to create these different partnerships. We are delighted to see this strategic partnership with the European Union that will increase in the coming years, especially in the field of energy. We have partnerships for electricity. We're now uh, invest, uh, accessing of a partnership for gas with Spain and LNG. We are seeing partnerships in hydrogen and will soon sign not only with Germany, but also with Portugal. So we are building ties between Moroccan and international research centers. Nevertheless, believe you me, the Moroccan business environment is one of the best. Each year we gain points. We were very far before, let's say we, we ranked about 110th when it comes to doing business. Today, we are 53rd, and we plan to be amongst the top 30 countries when it comes to doing business in different areas, and more particularly in sectors, and especially the green economy and renewable energies. Thank you, Mr. Minister. That was quite positive and very dynamic. We can see that there's the economy behind it all, and that's what we need to convince. Francisco Scarace. Francisco Scarace was saying earlier that uh, we need to convince people there is no risk into going, going to renewable energy, then there is really a very healthy economic context, and you are making the proof of it. There's a proof of the concept, and I think it's really important when I see some private investor considering that there is too much risk to invest in this sector, and, um, and in particular, of course, in Africa and North Africa. I will ask now uh, Mr. Sosten Erdan. If you permit, Moroccan experience and show has shown that there's no risk. The contracts signed are well balanced. And I suggest that IRENA should designate a committee, a panel of experts to examine different contracts. And they'll see that in the coming years, because there'll be contracts in the years to come that will be balanced between stakeholders. The Moroccan experience has shown that the different stakeholders can all win. The goal is to have projects where we can gain more in investments. It's not just about generating kilowatts, but also projects that must be successful so that we can promote our country as an investment platform. A last message, if you permit, Madam. Africa, I say this and I repeat it, and I've said it time and time again, Africa doesn't need high tech now, technology or conventional funding that we have seen so far. Today, Africa is an extraordinary market and needs to have well-adapted solutions. I believe in creating joint ventures between American, European companies with African companies that will enable us to better apprehend the African market. It's a great market. Just to speak about electrification, I think with mini grids and off grids, by mixing different energies, it will enable us to develop well-adapted solutions for Africa 
and we can make our country a hub in this field. Thank you. I think if everyone doesn't call you on the phone just after this, I think something is wrong. Thank you and congratulations in a way. I will now give the floor what Germany wants to do, um, not uh, only because, uh, of course, you will have new election in the f in very soon now, and that uh, in, in the next, of course, years, the implementation of the 55% and the net zero will require enormously uh, the contribution of Germany to lead the path. So I, I'm really, really very important to hear you, what is your perspective and your challenges. Uh, to, to just to make these goals, which are again, very ambitious for whole Europe. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for that. And thank you also uh, my colleagues uh, from Canada and uh, Morocco um, to playing the ball uh, directly into, into my field and of course everybody else. And um, it, is, it is interesting this debate when you're talking about renewables and uh, a pathway um, to climate neutrality, because for us, as you all know, uh, renewables are the pathway to climate neutrality. We um, will stop nuclear power generation um, end of next year, and uh, we have just agreed to phase out coal uh, completely. So we are, we are left with renewables, uh, and that is good. Uh, that's the, the first point. And uh, you said, Madame, that uh, we are <clears throat> running up to election in September. That's true, uh, as we do every four years. Um, but uh, there is one thing which is uh, absolutely clear, uh, that the way uh, we have just chosen uh, will not change at all. Um, that is also due to one very important fact that we have uh, carved in our law, uh, the climate neutrality by 2050. That was for us extremely important and specifically during our uh, presidency um, of uh, the EU in the uh, second uh, half of last year. Uh, it was uh, the very, very important um, step for us in order to convince uh, all Europe uh, to uh, agree on that 55% uh, goal in 2030. So for us, it is absolutely clear that uh, the pathway uh, has been has been uh, painted. Uh, the question is, uh, what are we doing to meet uh, these requirements? What are we doing to go that way uh, by our own and together with other countries? And that is, uh, I think, why it is extremely important that IRENA is putting that topic uh, on its very priority of the agenda because we all have to understand, um, as it was clearly also said uh, by, by uh, the Moroccan minister and the uh, Canadian minister, we have to um, do our homework in our home countries. Yes, so we have to find the best ways, uh, what can we do on our own to meet uh, the pathway to climate neutrality. But we have to understand that we have to install a global pathway. Uh, without a global pathway, it would be impossible. It would be simply impossible. And by establishing uh, that global pathway together with the national pathway, we do need help. And that is uh, uh, where ARENA is really uh, the best organization uh, to help us uh, because it is all on renewables. And uh, we uh, must not only look on ourselves for partners, uh, we can make use of ARENA uh, that they trying to get partners together. Uh, not individual ones, uh, that may be a very tough job for IRENA because uh, if they would connect uh, individuals all the time, that is uh, simply something very, very difficult and uh, time consuming. But um, to, to find, as uh, Minister Rabba was saying, um, um, ways uh, how partners can deal with each other for not everybody to reinvent the wheel again. And uh, that is something which is very important. Um, and there is another very important point, which is um, all about hydrogen, but I put it in some different ways. We all have uh, understood that um, we have two energy carriers. Uh, the one is electricity and the other one is molecules. We still have molecules and we will continue to have molecules. And by understanding that, uh, it is absolutely clear that uh, the molecule, it's the smallest one in the world, <laughs> hydrogen molecule, can be used as the most important energy carrier to carry around 
renewables uh, all around the world. And that is very important for us because uh, when we were talking about um, electricity and working together with, every with, with other countries, we always talked about so-called electrical neighbors. To, so we talked about those countries to which we were electrically uh, connected. For Germany, there are a lot of countries uh, where we have um, electric connection to, but there are other countries around the world which don't have that uh, much possibility. Um, and uh, they are also looking for partners uh, to meeting climate neutrality in 2050. And that is where um, hydrogen, that is where the molecule comes into the game because uh, it now allows us to uh, harvest, uh, for instance, wind and solar in countries around the world uh, and put it into that carrier of hydrogen and simply call it, ship it uh, around the world. And by that building, not only new partnerships, but also building uh, new trading partnerships. Uh, and if you trade energy, it is very logic that you will continue to trade also other things. Uh, and it's also at the end of the day, a peacemaking instrument. If you trade with uh, partners, uh, it is the best way of not um, uh, fighting each other. So this common pathway and how to achieve um, a format for that common pathway, that is very important. I mentioned yesterday um, at the ministerial uh, point that we um, <clears throat> are talking since years about sector coupling. So meaning that uh, we need to couple the uh, transport sector with the electricity sector, with the building sector, with the industry sector. What we haven't talked about is the nation coupling. Uh, that for us is something uh, which is now coming into the next step of uh, energy transition uh, towards meeting climate neutrality. So we need to couple those nations. Um, and there are principally two types of nations. Uh, if you look uh, on that uh, for, from the energy perspective, there are nations which can deliver energy and there are nations which need energy. And Germany definitely uh, is in the position uh, that we need uh, energy, that we need renewable energy. So we need to look for partners around the world where we can trade with our technology, of course, uh, which we are innovating all the time, but also uh, where we can trade with the renewable energy and be it in the hydrogen format or be it uh, in the electricity format in Europe uh, or be it in formats of uh, synthetic fuels or ammonia, that will certainly be uh, something the future will show. But we have to create formats um, how to do so. Um, and we have, um, well, we are discussing uh, a format which we call H2 Global. And H2 Global simply means that uh, we can think about uh, to auction the um, demand, uh, like in Germany, uh, of hydrogen or ammonia or synthetic fuel. Um, and uh, we can also auction the supply in a certain country, in a certain region, for instance, like Morocco. And then the question is, what's the uh, price uh, difference between the auction uh, for supply and the auction for demand? And when we think about mechanisms, how to support, uh, to um, close these price gaps in between, in order to scale up um, the whole supply chain from the production of the renewable energy over the production of hydrogen, over the transport of hydrogen, down to the usage of hydrogen in whatsoever application, be it in the steel industry or be it uh, in, in uh, the local municipalities or wherever, then we can build up a system uh, which um, can uh, work for not only two partners, but which may be a role model uh, for many, many other countries around. So that is something where we are really looking uh, forward um, to using these uh, formats in order to trade wind and trade uh, solar energy uh, via other formats than only electricity uh, around the world. So for us, the pathway towards climate neutrality is the second pillar now um, besides of electricity, having now molecules in our hand, which we can ship around the world. And for that, IRENA is a very important uh, partner for us uh, in order to facilitate um, not only um, the um, nations coupling, but also uh, formats uh, for that nation coupling. And I'm looking very much forward um, to the work of Arena and Francesco. Thank you very much for doing that work. And uh, 
yeah, thank you everybody, of course, listening uh, to me. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Dawson Herdan. I think uh, you, you, you give really a very complete view on both the domestic element, what we, why we need a global pathway, and, and in a way how these technologies are probably facilitating this consistency and convergence between different domestic policies and around renewable and very clear role for ARENA, by the way, you, you clearly describe. So um, I, I would, uh, it was organized like this that I would end the moderation to my dear friend, Karsten Saar, who is, a, uh, well, every, everything in, in, on climate and environment and energy, of course, uh, Karsten has has played an enormous long-term role uh, and, and really a, a deep friend uh, that has um, facilitated all the conversation across Europe and internationally on uh, putting this long-term vision and of course on renewable energy in particular, but not only. Uh, but before this, handing uh, over to him, the moderation, I'd like to introduce um, Minister Arifin Tasrif, he's not here, but we will listen to a short video. And of course, Indonesia, because he's the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources in Indonesia, is of course a very, very important uh, country these days. As you know, very sensitive to climate impacts. Uh, at the same time, a lot of uh, an energy mix heavily relying on fossil fuels. And, uh, and for the moment, uh, I think every, everybody will look in particular in the prospect of the G20 meetings uh, and the renewable interest on the G20 meetings on ecological transition and net zero. Uh, that, that will be of course an important role for Indonesia. So um, I, I'm happy to introduce uh, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia and then uh, give the floor then for to continue our discussion. Thank you. And thank you for having me allowed to participate in your discussion until now. Excellencies, ministers and ambassadors, Director General of IRENA, speakers and moderator, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Jakarta. It is indeed a pleasure for me to speak before such a distinguished forum. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the organizing committee for preparing today's event. Reducing carbon means reducing the utilization of fossil fuel. In this regard, Indonesia has been implementing several key programs, such as one, biodiesel mandatory, co-firing RDF utilization, two, replacing diesel with renewable energy in power plants, including bio-based renewables, three, non-electricity, non-biofuel utilization, such as briquette, agricultural product drying, and biogas. Since biodiesel plays an important role in supporting national energy security, the Indonesian government also has made strategic plan for biodiesel development. For instance, the government will continue to implement the B30 program by conducting regularly monitoring and evaluation, facilitating the bottlenecking that might occur enhancing supporting infrastructure, as well as ensuring sustainability of incentives. As for B40 and B50 implementation program, currently a comprehensive study of blending composition, economic evaluations, which also covers readiness, feedstock and supporting infrastructures are being prepared. Road test of B40 is carried out, which will be followed by trial on existing diesel power plants. Furthermore, the government with one of its state-owned enterprises, Pertamina, are developing green refineries to produce green diesel, green gasoline, and green after. On July 2020, Pertamina has produced the D100 in its refinery in Sumatra at the initial capacity of 1,000 barrels per day. To support this program, we will prepare regulatory support, incentives, and supporting infrastructures, including encourage the development of supporting industries. While for the development of CPO hydrogenation, a green diesel standalone plant demo is currently in development. It is expected that the pilot and product testing will be carried out in December 2021. With the increasing use of biodiesel, the need for feedstock will also increase. In order to secure feedstock supply and minimize land forest clearing, our ministry 
in collaboration with related stakeholders, will use reclamation post mining land. This cooperation includes seeking for suitable crops based on land condition and climate. We wish to develop various feedstock, not only from oil palm trees, but also using other domestic natural resources. This thing is, ladies and gentlemen, to mitigate climate change and make notable impact, low carbon energy system implementation is a key to an environmentally responsible future development. I'm sure that sharing of knowledge and lesson learned through such a distinguished forum is important to successful transition towards carbon neutrality. In this modern area of fast connectivity and globalization, the world has become a global village. As members of the same village, we should all work together in making the world a better place for a better future. Cooperation in the levels of bilateral, regional, and multilateral is needed to foster international collaboration. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the second part of this panel discussion. We will continue the discussion on different aspects of renewables and pathways to carbon neutrality. Uh, for those who have come in later, uh, my name is Carsten Sach. I'm Director General at the German Ministry of the Environment and have a long IRENA history as well. Thank you, Laurence, for your kind introduction. Uh, net zero or climate neutrality by mid-century seems to be the new normal for policy and also for business and societies. Uh, the question we are discussing is how to get there. What are the challenges? How do we get there? The second one, what we heard already, the renewables are the backbone of this transition. Uh, and the third one is uh, how do we combine short-term policy challenges uh, with our long-term vision, the transformation uh, we are going to do. I have a panel with five panelists who feature a range of different backgrounds representing the complexity of the challenge and the need uh, for holistic and coherent approaches to, to achieve net zero. And uh, I would like to briefly introduce all the five panelists first and then move to the discussion uh, uh, with all of them uh, putting some uh, short questions uh, to my panelists. First, I would like to introduce Ms. Joanna Wittington. Uh, she is Director General for Energy and Security of the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy of the United Kingdom, who is also uh, the president of COP26. Uh, the second panelist is His Excellency Minister Advaita Mushet Ali Al Mara, the chairman of the Department of Energy in Abu Dhabi. In this capacity, he is responsible for leading Abu Dhabi's energy transition towards a sustainable energy future. Uh, the third panelist uh, is Dominic Broy from the World Economic Forum. He is uh, uh, there the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum and a long-time friend. The fourth panelist is uh, Mr. Marco Alvera. He is uh, the CEO of SNAM, one of Europe's leading natural gas utilities. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Daryl Wilson, who is the Executive Director of the Hydrogen Council, a global CEO tool a CEO-led initiative for leading companies with the goal to foster the clean energy transition. So I would start with, with Joanna. Uh, the UK, Joanna, has legislated for a net zero goal by 2050, and the UK will be chairing COP26, uh, a critical milestone in the process of delivering uh, on the Paris Agreement. So how are you approaching within the UK uh, these uh, uh, targets and uh, how do you plan to reaching net zero in the UK and what is your advice to others uh, uh, of what could be helpful in achieving this target? Joanna. 
Thank you very much, Carsten, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very nice to see you here. Um, as you say, uh, we have all come a really long way. Even the most ambitious emissions targets a few years ago left some parts of the economy where emissions are toughest to reach still able to pollute leaving other sectors that were more easily electrifiable or offset to pick up the slack. But we are now all dealing with these true net zero commitments and the task does get a lot harder. As you said, in 2019, we legislated for what we call net zero, setting into law a 2050 target, which is having a profound impact on policy making decisions on energy, on housing, agriculture, transport, industry, and finance. And whilst we all find it hugely exciting and the opportunity that this transition will bring to the economy is significant in terms of new jobs, new skills, and new technologies, and of course, a cleaner environment, there's no doubt that getting there will be an enormous challenge, touching all of our economy and requiring a significant mobilization of capital. Last year, our Prime Minister announced a 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution, which will set out, or which sets out our vision for the technologies of the future. And he followed this with the publication of an energy white paper in December. The white paper set out a really significant role for electricity as we use electricity to decarbonize some of our emissions intensive sectors, in particular transport, but also in the United Kingdom, the heating of our homes and buildings. This requires us to fully decarbonize the production of power but also to respond to the challenge of an almost doubling in demand for electricity. So the 10 point plan outlined some of the key projects and uh, that we'll need to undertake to help us establish new capabilities. We looked at in particular the future of the hydrogen economy where we'll be investing 240 million pounds into supply chain infrastructure research and development and demonstration sites across the country for green and blue hydrogen. Achieving a hydrogen economy will also require us to invest in carbon capture technologies that allow us to reduce emissions from the production of blue hydrogen and bury carbon deep underground or use it as feedstock for other processes. With a billion pound investment into four carbon capture clusters across the United Kingdom, we'll capture 10 megatons of carbon per year by 2030, the equivalent of taking 4 million cars off the road. Crucially underlying all of this is a recognition that to meet the challenges of the rest of the century, we need to dramatically level up our skills and job space. By investing in industrial decarbonization, energy efficiency improvements, offshore wind, advanced nuclear technologies and smart grids, we're not only tackling some of the hardest to abate emissions, but we're also bringing opportunities and high skilled, high paid jobs to all parts of our country. As we look forward to COP26 later this year, it will be through dialogues with partners around this virtual tables countries, private companies, and expert organizations alike, that we'll be able to make a really concerted effort to achieve our collective goal. And we really look forward to our continued cooperation with IRENA on this vital agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you for laying out your very comprehensive roadmap or plan and, 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 and making the bridge uh, towards your COP26 presidency. We know that not everybody is there yet. Uh, so what is your advice? What should happen to strengthen plans uh, uh, to raise ambition at the global level? You need to unmute. Joanna, you are still on mute. mute. Now you're Apologies, my computer chose to shut <laughs> at that moment. Um, so we have looked in a number of different ways at what we can do. 
domestically. And as you say, it's important that what we do domestically can then be leveraged to achieve this global ambition. We think there are a number of things that in addition to setting a target, a net zero target are important. We think that the development of policy frameworks with clear regulatory and statutory backing to them has been very important at a sector level. So when we look at the power sector, the emissions caused by buildings, by transport, by industry and land use. We've benefited from broad political support, broad consensus politically around what we're doing. But another thing that's been super helpful has been the provision of independent advice in our case from the Committee on Climate Change, which has helped to um, depoliticize the process for setting targets and introducing new policies. And then I think the other thing which will be really important and be great to hear from others on is the role that innovation can play in providing, we've looked to provide support for technical and market innovation supporting technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture, but also floating offshore wind um, and energy storage. And these will be essential for all of us if we're to um, allow, um, to reach the net zero goal, both in the timescales that we need, but also in a way that's affordable and sustainable for a global economy. Thank you, Joanna. Let me now turn uh, to His Excellency al Mara. Uh, Abu Dhabi has played a leading role in mainstreaming renewables, including uh, some very large solar installations, uh, while uh, being still a major oil and gas producer. So what is your vision towards net zero and uh, uh, what kind of commitments uh, does your country have? Your Excellency, uh, well, the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, of the, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kristen, and I'd like to uh, send my regards to all the participants, to the vice uh, chairman, uh, vice president, and uh, director general. Um, hello, and um, good to be among you talking about uh, ambitious uh, target when we are going toward the zero uh, carbon uh, energy. I agree uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Fatah Biro that 80% uh, of that is actually contributed to the uh, uh, energy sector. On this part of the world, uh, with the hydrocarbon uh, main driver for uh, the economic, that actually did not uh, stop us by committing to the Paris Agreement. We've made uh, the national determinated uh, contribution but in 2015, we made a 24% to be reached by 2021. Uh, uh, we are focusing toward meeting uh, those objectives. We further uh, enhanced our target on the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, lately, on uh, December 2022, we could uh, pump it up and even do much better by 23% more. We are focusing on reducing uh, 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 the emission by uh, uh, 70 million tons. Um, our strategy in-house within UAE focuses by 2050 to have 50% uh, of uh, that energy comes in from the clean energy. So in summary, we are actually devoting all our uh, uh, focus and commitment toward uh, zero carbon target. Uh, for us, it is a journey. For us, uh, this will never stop. We'll be always uh, tapping in to the innovation, tapping in to the new technology, tapping in to the digitalization. Uh, we have uh, celebrated operation of the first uh, nuclear plant going toward the clean uh, energy. Uh, we also celebrated uh, a huge achievement to, on solar uh, development as well. So all of that are evidence uh, toward sticking to our commitment when it comes to the uh, zero carbon uh, targets. 
Excellency, thank you very much uh, uh, and uh, for your commitment and, and also highlighting uh, the role which innovation plays. Uh, I have one question for you. Uh, so, uh, Your Excellency, what kind of uh, framework conditions within your country and uh, uh, outside your country and uh, what kind of international cooperation would you find helpful to, uh, to assist you in, 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 in traveling this journey towards net zero? Uh, first of all, definitely the commitment made by the government on the Paris Agreement, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, the benefit from uh, reports and technologies and experience that are being shared internationally and the best evidence of this, us participating with ARENA uh, Assembly. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let me now turn to Dominic Roy. Dominic, welcome as well, uh, Managing Director of the WEF. Uh, so we were talking, and I know that you, Dominic, uh, were deeply involved uh, in that on pathways to net zero. So what, which elements of this require multilateral action and, and how would you get as a World Economic Forum also business on board uh, on this journey? Dominic, please. Thank you, Carsten, um, and it's a delight to be here. Um, thank you for welcoming us and the World Economic Forum to this um, assembly. Uh, uh, Vice President, Director General, we are absolutely delighted to continue the strong working relationship with ARENA um, since signing our MOU with you last year has been a huge success and we're looking forward to much progress in the future. Uh, as you know, we're the International Organization for Public-Private Collaboration, so re reaching net zero um, is firmly within the remit we see of requiring that kind of collaboration, the public-private collaboration, in particular, as we heard earlier, the private sector. Um, Promisingly, we're seeing more commitments coming through from business um, as well as government over the past uh, 12 months or so. I think arguably we are starting to reach a tipping point on net zero commitments to 2050. Um, it's perhaps to 2030 uh, where there's a short run focus which might be required. And I was very pleased to hear comments from our uh, UK government representative about that with the focus on COP26. Um, so it's about converting you know, more and more of those commitments to action. Uh, we see two priority areas um, where there's a real um, potential to convert that commitment to action. One is in the heavier industries, the hard to abate sectors, so-called steel, cement, chemicals, aviation, trucking, uh, those kinds of things. And the other is in cities. So let me just touch briefly on both of those. Um, Uh, Carsten, you remember at the uh, Secretary General's Climate Action Summit uh, in 2019, uh, we launched um, an initiative called Mission Possible to drive to net zero by 2050. Uh, 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 those hard to abate industry sectors, those ones that I mentioned, and I'm delighted to say um, that uh, since that launch, um, a group of 30 companies has turned into over 300 companies and organizations and institutions. Uh, we have a great mobilization with key partners for this Mission Possible partnership now, um, which will drive forward and into COP26. Uh, so great progress uh, there. Um, we're also seeing momentum um, in the urban area environment. Um, and of course, when it comes to cities, you know, two, two thirds of the global population uh, live in urban areas um, uh, by 2050. So in the face of that rapid urbanization, can we do the same in terms of mobilization for that net zero in cities? And I'm delighted to say that um, alongside the heavy industry mobilization, um, we at the World Economic Forum um, have launched a program on net zero carbon cities, um, which is bringing together over 70 stakeholders so far from 10 different sectors, uh, recommending that cities and businesses embrace action for systemic efficiency, ultra efficient buildings, smart energy infrastructure, clean electrification, those sorts of things. So quite heavy on the innovation agenda that was mentioned earlier. So to conclude, the mobilization um, of key industry sectors across the heavier industries um, in progress, gathering momentum is not easy. One has to work across multiple organizations and multiple sectors um, and also in the city space. Uh, but uh, we feel uh, pragmatically optimistic 
uh, about the momentum that can be created through to COP26, particularly given the geopolitical conditions that were mentioned earlier. And again, I'd like to underscore and thank our, uh, our friends at IRENA, particularly the DG and the great commitment and collaboration we have with them through our MOU. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dominic. Uh, and, and the two sectors are, are, are excellent ones, and, and you know that uh, I take a lot of uh, interest in those as well. So, but if you would say, you said, you, you're very successful in mobilizing, but what are the instruments or what are the issues you really need to achieving that? Is that sustainable finance? Is that clear regulation? Is that uh, uh, creating new markets? Uh, probably it's a mix of all of it. So I just would like to, to get your view on that one. Yeah, it's a great question. And there is a mixture. Um, and one of the most interesting things um, about it is that um, there's also the idea of a demand pull so if there were, for example, in the cement, which is one of the hard to abate sectors, upward of 30% of cement is publicly purchased. So if there were policy signals around demand pulls, um, public purchase uh, agreements, procurement, that sort of thing. Um, similarly, um, if you look at shipping, which is another one of these key sectors, imagine if large consumer goods companies said that we will only have our goods, who have net zero commitments, we'll only have our goods um, going on uh, ships that are also net zero. So then there's a demand pull from those um, with consumer goods being uh, exported around the world. So these are some of the horizontals as well as the classics of course financing. Um, this transitionary financing piece is becoming more and more important. What kind of financial instruments can help in that transition to 2030 and beyond, as well as large infrastructure investments like uh, hydrogen, that kind of thing. Um, I think the key of these policy uh, frameworks, which was mentioned earlier um, by a couple of colleagues on these panels. Um, and that requires that inter iteration and interaction between the public and the private and key experts to chart out what can be done, how quickly it can be done, and what levers can be pulled across that whole portfolio. Um, the final thing, if I can, I'd just say, Carsten, is actually, and I think Laurence touched upon it, as did you, there's a systemic change at work. And one of the most interesting systemic shifts that we're seeing is the rise of um, what is coined stakeholder capitalism amongst the uh, private sector. That is that um, uh, the delivery of goods and services, the reason for being a corporation into the 21st century might not necessarily only be about quarterly return to shareholders, but also the value that is delivered to a wider range of stakeholders. Um, and we see that theme related through things like ESG metrics being picked up more and more. And there's a very interesting systemic shift, I think, going on across the corporate community. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, that's a, a perfect closing words because uh, now we turn to the private sector. Marco Alvera, uh, can you tell us uh, how your company uh, views the challenges and opportunities of a net zero pathway and what actions you are taking? Thank you very much, Dr. Sack, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you uh, to Irene and Francesco La Camera for, for having us here. So we are very big fans of net zero. Not only it's an important target in itself, but it forces us to think about the final state, the, the, the end game of the energy system. So it's bringing forward a lot of discussions around the balance between electrons and molecules. As SNAM, we're doing our homework. We have committed to becoming net zero for scope one and scope two by 2040. So as Dominic was saying, we're in the category that's trying to bring the targets forward and we will have significant reduction by 2030 already. As Irina say in their excellent work on, on the net zero, by 2050, they expect 49% of energy to be electrified. The remaining 51%, and it could potentially be even a little more, is going to be very hard to electrify. And, and we heard that also from uh, Mrs. Whittington in the UK. When you talk about heating, you have a lot of seasonal issues. And so we believe the world really needs uh, green molecules in the forms of uh, blue and indeed green uh, hydrogen. So what are we doing and what can we do what needs to be done? Well, we heard uh, Mr. Herdon talk about sector coupling. Sector coupling will play a huge role and this idea of nations coupling is, is a very strategic uh, opportunity. We think hydrogen will be produced where there is cheaper renewables. Uh, we heard uh, about the clear strategy for uh, Abu Dhabi. We, we have the opportunity to produce uh, solar and wind 
produced hydrogen where it's cheap and we can transport that over very long distances with pipelines at a very cheap price. SNAM is the world's largest pipeline operator after Gazprom, so we're number two in the world. We have pipelines going into North Africa, going into, uh, into Austria towards Russia, and now with TAP going all the way into the Caspian. What's key is to reduce the cost of green hydrogen. Uh, we have to do that by scaling up the manufacturing of electrolyzers. Electrolyzers are still, as we know, in, in their infancy. There's a lot of opportunity to improve the materials, the technologies, like we're doing for batteries. We need gigafactories for electrolyzers. As SNAM, uh, we want to accelerate all this. Hydrogen will come, but rather than waiting for it to happen on its own, rather than letting inertia play out, as we know, inertia can take decades to uh, act change, we want to push and to accelerate. So we have uh, gotten together with Aquapower, uh, seven companies, Aquapower, uh, CWP Renewables, Envision, Iberdrola, Orsted, Yara, and SNAM. We have founded the Green Hydrogen Catapult, we will offer this project for the COP26, which will be run uh, by the UK and chaired also by Italy. So it's a joint COP26. We will offer this platform, this private platform to say, let's make green hydrogen at $2 per kilo in five years time. Why do we pick $2 a kilo? We think this will be really important to send a price signal so that people can put that number into their models, use that number for their uh, investment decisions. In order to get to $2 a kilo, of course, $2 in, in sunny or windy places, uh, we need to bring the volume of electrolyzers, we think, to 25 gigawatts. So uh, it's really important that we do so. The European Commission we heard earlier is, is fully uh, committed to that. We have blending, which we can use uh, to accelerate the creation of green hydrogen markets. So this $2 a kilo is a real commitment and is a tipping point after which it can become economical without the need for too much subsidies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, just uh, uh, one follow-up question. Uh, uh, great commitments uh, uh, you have been putting forward uh, and uh, in the Alliance, I think it's a very important contribution to COP26, but uh, you have also heard a lot of government plans. You mentioned uh, uh, country coupling and others. So what could we, governments and government representatives do to, to just speed up uh, uh, the development towards net zero? Thank you very much for the follow on question. Well, uh, for, first of all, this catapult I talked about will get bigger. So the seven are the founders, our idea is to get to 40, 50 companies because we need to activate and governments is really where, where they are helping and they can help is to activate that entrepreneurial energy that will push people like us to take the final investment decisions sooner than when we're forced to do so. So we think the uh, very successful policies on renewable subsidies created the big market for renewables, uh, but that came at a big cost to consumers. Governments today have to figure out, and it's a huge opportunity to uh, combine public and private policy, as Dominic was saying, Earlier, there's this huge tidal shift towards ESG. There's hundreds of billions, if not trillions of ESG dollars that are waiting for bankable projects. There are companies like us that can't wait to start investing in bankable projects. We need some focused policy nudges. Governments like, like Mr. Herden said very clearly should focus on the low hanging fruits and in those alliances, that collaboration that will allow us to avoid the mistakes we did uh, with, with the first round of renewable sponsorships, which cost us essentially a trillion dollars for consumer money. We need to focus on the low hanging fruits, really focus on scaling up the electrolyzers, creating those partnerships with countries where production can be cheaper and really worrying about the midstream. The midstream will be key to move the molecules from where they're cheaper to produce to where the markets is. And the idea to combine trade uh, with, with, uh, with support is very important so that you can start trading demand uh, for supply. And this is nothing new. We did exactly the same when we were creating the gas market in Europe. We were as SNAM and as, as, as EON and, and other companies, Uniper, we were uh, Gas de France. We were going into the countries and offering demand to Russia in exchange for big pipelines to build the gas. So we have to rediscover that entrepreneurial spirit of, of the kind of 70s and 80s where we really created a market from scratch. We have to do that in a really accelerated way.
Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Let me finally turn uh, to Daryl Wilson, uh, the executive director of the Hydrogen Council. So you have heard quite a lot of people speaking about hydrogen. You have heard uh, uh, the price tag, uh, uh, which Marco just put forward. Uh, uh, there are huge expectations uh, on hydrogen. So, uh, so how do we best scale up uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, as uh, one of the big elements for the transition we are undergoing. Daryl, please. Thank you, Karsten. It's a pleasure to be with this uh, important group and in part of uh, this very important discussion. I think we just heard uh, a fantastic example of the alignment between the public interest and the uh, strength of the private sector in collaborating and delivering on the promise of hydrogen. Um, and industry needs to see the signals from governments uh, for energy infra infrastructure investments. Uh, these investments are often made with a view of 30 or 40 year time horizon. And so now is the time to be setting very clear signals as our previous just speaker just said, uh, to set the scene so that the industry can act uh, strongly into this pressing uh, global issue. Hydrogen is indeed one of the critical solutions. The IEA has shown in their forecast that uh, hydrogen will represent about 17% of global energy demand uh, sourcing uh, by 2050. So uh, hydrogen needs to grow up and deliver on the promise that's been there for some time. And we have the confidence that that's going to happen in the near term now. Uh, but large scale investments are needed. And this is where industry and the private sector uh, need to act together. Four years ago, the Hydrogen Council was formed as a coalition of CEOs from industry uh, who work in this field. And we made tremendous progress. Uh, yesterday, we met uh, more than 100 CEOs, global uh, CEOs coming together around the vision of delivering on the opportunity of hydrogen for decarbonization. Uh, one of the important things, and this has been touched on several times already today, is hydrogen can deliver decarbonization in those sectors where uh, it's not possible to fully electrify. And so freight logistics, industrial heating, industrial feedstock are very critical vectors where hydrogen can deliver on our decarbonization objectives. And we've seen in the last year, of course, a, a huge rise in uh, leadership from many countries. Our, our session yesterday with the Hydrogen Council was opened by President von der Leyen, uh, talking about the important place of hydrogen. Indeed, in the European Union, we've seen a tremendous leadership as we have in France, Germany, Japan, China, uh, many countries around the world uh, now having a strategy around hydrogen. And I must say that this has been enabled by the renewable energy sector. As we've seen renewable energy input costs come down, and this is a very important part of creating green hydrogen, uh, that enables uh, hydrogen to grow up and deliver uh, its place. But uh, as the, the previous speaker just mentioned, uh, one of the impediments that we have faced for some time is the issue of cost. And, and scale up is very critical uh, to bring the cost down. Uh, that scale up will not happen by itself. Um, it's not an innovation journey where cost will just fall out of this system. But not, much like we saw with uh, renewable wind and, and solar technology, the cost will come down as deployments uh, multiply. And this is where governments have an enabling role uh, to help us to scale the industry and get those costs down. The Hydrogen Council has been committed to a fact and science-based a sourcing of data to help governments around the world to, to navigate their pathway into realizing uh, the opportunity of hydrogen. Just yesterday, as part of our meeting, we released a new report on decarbonization pathways. And I think it's a tremendous tool to help policymakers to see their way through uh, to realize the opportunity of hydrogen for their economy and their locale. Uh, some areas are well endowed with renewable energy resources and they can capitalize on hydrogen immediately. Places like Chile, for example, where the cost of producing renewable energy is among the lowest in the world. And then there are other places in, like Canada, where I come from, where we have both a rich uh, renewable energy capability and also fossil fuel resources, which can be decarbonized with CCS technology and clean hydrogen can be delivered uh, on the, the, the back of the transformed oil and gas industry. So there are multiple pathways to get to uh, the promise and opportunity of hydrogen. 
and the council's ready and willing and able uh, to support all of the members of IRENA to, to find what uh, approach to hydrogen makes best sense for them to set the strategy and move through the journey of going from a, a national roadmap to a fully endorsed national strategy with targets and funding, and then move on into, into implementation. And we're seeing many, many countries around the world progressing on that journey. And we believe that hydrogen will fully take its place in delivering our needs globally for decarbonization. Thank you, Daryl. Many people talk, Daryl, about uh, ARENA having a leading role in this transition uh, towards net zero based on, on renewables. From a hydrogen perspective, what uh, would you see as an important uh, task IRENA should take upon itself? The scale up of renewable energy production is absolutely fundamental. If there is, is not more green energy, there won't be green hydrogen. These things go lockstep. Uh, in our, our most recently published report, you'll find it on the website, to get electrolysis cost to come down, and our, our past speaker was just mentioning this, we need a scale up of 60 watt, 65 gigawatts of electrolysis capacity. Uh, and, and so the renewable energy to feed that, that hydrogen uh, is absolutely critical. And, and of course, the renewable energy industry has made great strides in, in many ways, especially in the area of cost. But the social license and social acceptance for renewable energy has to continue because the, ex the extent of renewable energy deployment in the world needs to go up by, by many orders of magnitude. So that's, that's a critical element is to, uh, to help navigate that path for public acceptance and to have the social license to deploy extensively more green energy uh, around the world. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, I would like to thank all panelists for their most interesting input. Uh, we heard how important it is to have a cl clear frameworks, a clear strategy, uh, uh, which uh, breaks down targets into roadmaps, then to policy strategies. Uh, we clearly heard how important it is that governments take an active role, for example, Dominic, you were proposing clear procurement uh, uh, in order to, to help scaling up, but uh, that uh, we heard in, in other interventions as well. So I don't want to sum up all the excellent input you have given because we're running a little bit behind of time. And with that, I would like to hand back to the chair of the session, Minister Singh. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I applaud my panelists. And with that, uh, Minister, I hand back over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sachs, for most ably conducting the panel uh, discussion. I also thank the panelists uh, for their uh, insights into the problem, the great mission before this world. I would now like to open the floor for interventions. We have, we already have some requests. I'll call the countries in the order of the requests received. So I call on Portugal uh, to make their intervention. I would request the uh, country and the panel, the countries, the speakers to limit their interventions to three minutes mm -hmm. because we have a pressure yeah. of time. Portugal, please. Well, thank you so much for this invitation. It's really a great pleasure to take the floor in such a relevant panel, in such a relevant conference, uh, distinguished vice president, uh, all the colleagues and all the people who are listening and participating in this conference. I'll start this intervention by referring that Portugal will continue to be at the forefront on the path towards carbon neutrality by 2050. We were the first country in the world to assume that carbon neutrality commitment and push for the adoption of this goal by the European Union. Clean energy is essential to achieve carbon neutrality. Portugal is delivering on its commitment. In later years, we significantly increase the share of renewables, both in the supply side and in the end use. However, motivation is high to go much further in this transition towards cleaner energy, thereby delivering the much needed transformation. In this path, 
Portugal decided to end cold fire power generation already this year, and we aim to achieve 80% of renewable energy in electricity generation by 2030. Simultaneously, we are supporting the installation of more renewable energy power generation, namely solar, through auction mechanisms. For, for two times, the auction of this year and the auction of last year, we beat the world record of the lowest price on producing electricity from solar. The COVID-19 pandemic brought us additional reasons to accelerate this transition and to pursue with renewed ambition our energy and climate goals. We are aware of the magnitude of the challenge, but our past performance on renewables and greenhouse gas emission reductions gives us the confidence that we will succeed. Greenhouse gas emissions were reduced by 26% in Portugal since 2005, and in 2020, the share of renewables of electricity generation reached 59%. This is solid evidence that decoupling is possible. In 2019, we reduced 8.7% of GHG emissions, while EU average was the reduction of 4.3%. And our GDP annual, GDP annual growth was 2.2%, when EU average was 1.5%. So the decoupled is really possible. Our economy grows much more than the average of the European Union, and our reduction of emissions was more than the double of the European Union. The conclusion is very obvious. Supporting the deployment of renewable energy to face climate and energy challenges is amongst the most cost-effective measures. Additionally, investment and collaboration are, in our view, crucial enabling conditions to reach our goals. These are global common challenges that require global common answers. The work of IRENA is starting with a collaborative framework on green hydrogen could be relevant in this context, providing a platform for dialogue and coordinated action to accelerate development and deployment of green hydrogen worldwide. We have already adopted our national hydrogen strategy last year, which foresees over two gigawatts of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers by 2030. And this represents 5% of the EU goal by 2030. Focusing on green hydrogen will have a double dividend, changing the historical Portuguese profile as a net energy importer into an energy exporter and creating a new industrial pole, consolidating the already boost Portuguese renewable energy sector. We are in very, very good conditions to produce a green hydrogen uh, in Portugal because we have the lowest price of uh, electricity coming from solar in the world. And as you know, the big part of the OPEX of producing hydrogen is the cost of electricity, of energy. Distinguished participants to conclude, large projects cannot be developed in an isolated manner but through open dialogue engaging relevant institutions, private sector and civil society, and creating strong partnerships. Portugal is ready to actively contribute to the work that IRENA will develop on this field in the coming, sorry, in the coming years. And thank you. Thank you, uh, Portugal. Uh, I now give the floor to Ukraine. Uh, your Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, uh, surely 2020 was a year of a great turbulence and the pandemic hit hard every economy and every industry in the world. Ukraine and its energy sector are not exception. 
As we look for ways to recovery, there is one thing to keep in mind. Times like these are also an opportunity to a change. We can give up the old ways and outdated policies and adopt new ones for a more sustainable future. Thus, it is important that Ukraine's economic recovery and uh, energy sector reform align with the green transition. Ukraine is in committed uh, to the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Ukraine aims to become climate neutrality till 2050. Current energy strategy till 2035 is under revision by the Ministry of Energy, which seeks to introduce more ambitious measures to carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emission reduction. And this year we will develop new energy strategy till 2050 based on the EU Green Deal uh, goals. The green transition should be only just. Current Ukraine's energy strategy targets a balanced growth of the renewables in the country's energy balance for the decarbonization of its economy. Now we have a 12 uh, percent share of rest generation. Our strategic target uh, for 2035 is having 25 percent of energy coming from renewable sources will be rich and the projected growth is actually much higher and we think uh, uh, have more than 60 percent target uh, for 2050 uh, as uh, uh, attainable as well. Solar, wind, and hydro, uh, hydropower target with uh, nuclear, uh, together with uh, nuclear energy, are uh, considered the most uh, relevant uh, foundation for Ukraine's uh, future carbon free energy generation. At the same time, our agriculture sector provides a significant resources base for development of bioenergy, and we are getting ready to use this potential. We aim at replace a thermal generation that use uh, coal with more environmental friendly sources. And we are actually working together um, and working uh, toward these goals. In the recent year, Ukraine's uh, showed a rapid growth in the installed capacity of rest uh, facilities. We, uh, as uh, our uh, um, previous uh, speaker, uh, Portugal, uh, we launch green auctions uh, starting this year, uh, and uh, we are welcome uh, all uh, participants to take part uh, in, in, in this uh, work. As Commissioner Simpson has mentioned, the EU has adopted a hydrogen strategy for climate neutral Europe until 2050. Ukraine is considered a priority partner for the EU due to its potential for green hydrogen production and the existing gas uh, trans, uh, transportation infrastructure, GTS, integrated with EU. We begin to work on the concept and legal foundation for hydrogen energy development. We are interested not only in the export of hydrogen to Europe, but also in its uh, use uh, as uh, energy sources in Ukraine. The GTS operator will evaluate uh, readiness and uh, reliability of the system for a new energy sources in order to ensure efficient and safe operation of the system transportation roads will be identified and the appropriate technical regulation will be adopted. I'm personally committed to support the launch of a pilot project with foreign partners, as well as project of international technical assistance to create a domestic hydrogen market in Ukraine. We are aware that clearly outlined and transport rules are needed uh, for a quick integration with the European market. I am convinced that uh, this uh, 11th session of the assembly will serve as a strong basis for further implementation of uh, mutual beneficial projects. We are open, uh, we are always open for, to cooperation in global sustainable energy development and will always support energy transition through efficient joint work. There is a lot of opportunities to create a greener and more prosperous future in energy sector with the government of our countries as well as businesses and NGOs who to contribute. Let's work together and thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. I now give the floor to Argentina. Argentina, please. Thank you very much, Vice President. Uh, 
They are ministers, distinguished delegates from governments and international organizations. It is a pleasure for me to participate in this important plenary meeting as a sideline of this year's Iran Assembly meeting. As you know, uh, hydrogen is gaining an increasing attention among the renewables for its potential to serve multiple purposes towards carbon neutrality, namely, it offers a way to decarbonize some sectors where it is difficult to reduce CO2 emissions, such as transport and energy intensive industries. It is versatile since it can be produced from different sources, either natural gas or renewable energy. It can be transported in liquid or gaseous form, and it can be transformed into electricity or used as a fuel. And it also serves as an energy storage and therefore has the potential to complement other renewable energies. Moreover, and following the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, hydrogen is said to play a key role in the just energy transition of many emerging economies. In Argentina, renewable energy sources are vast, affordable, and open up new opportunities for the future of energy. The legislation on renewable energy, which was passed in 2015, set forth that 20% of the consumed energy must be produced from renewable sources by 2025. As a result, the share of energy generation from non-conventional renewables has increased markedly in recent times, reaching up to 13% by the end of last year, of which wind gener energy account for about 70%. In relation to hydrogen, the Argentine government has already acknowledged it's important back in 2006 when the law for the promotion of hydrogen was passed. And in view of the prospective innovations and the global attention hydrogen is receiving, the current administration is working on an interministerial initiative towards the development of a hydrogen national strategy that would eventually feed in an update of the existing legislation. At the same time, the prospects for hydrogen production and use in Argentina are attracting the interest of a number of enterprises. For example, a private company has launched a pilot project to produce green hydrogen through wind energy from southern Argentina and Patagonia to be delivered to power plants in Buenos Aires. This is spanning about 2,500 kilometers distance. And additionally, IPF. Argentina's leading energy company, jointly with the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research, have created a consortium comprising about 35 companies with the purpose of establishing public-private partnerships along the hydrogen value chain. Argentina's current administration strongly believes that hydrogen plays a strategic role in the just transition toward a cleaner energy matrix and will lay great emphasis on the use and production of hydrogen in all its forms, or colors, as you can call it, from green hydrogen through renewable energy to blue hydrogen through natural gas. Luckily, Argentina is vastly endowed with all the natural resources as well as human resources to carry out its strategic vision and position itself as a key player in the future of hydrogen. We look forward to continuing bilateral and multilateral cooperation in order to achieve a more clean and sustainable energy generation. And we acknowledge the importance of deepening international cooperation in ARENA's platform like the one we are on now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Argentina. Uh, now I request Latvia. Latvia, you have the floor. The interventions will need to be limited to three minutes, please. I think uh, we are on a short on time. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. President, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great honor to have a chance to participate uh, in this event. Uh, Latvia uh, is experienced in, experienced in renewable energy generation. Uh, Latvia provides an excellent environment for uh, green energy projects. It should be noted that while producing 41% of its inland annual energy consumption from new renewable resources in 2019, uh, Latvia is one of the EU leaders uh, in terms of share of renewables in total uh, energy consumption 
the two most uh, prominent renewable energy sources in Latvia are biomass and hydropower. Nevertheless, um, there are still opportunities to be developed in uh, the wind power and solar energy segments, uh, including development of uh, citizen involvement in renewable energy um, in small scale production. Uh, and of course, uh, these processes and policies are increasing the public acceptance uh, for renewables in uh, the whole. Uh, European Union has committed to a climate neutrality by 2050 and uh, proposing legally binding uh, targets of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, Latvia also is planning to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Ambition for climate neutrality will require additional measures to decarbonize the energy sector. Latvia has adopted, adopted a comprehensive national energy and climate plan with ambition and measures to increase renewable energy shares in uh, annual energy consumption of 50% by uh, 2030. Latvia wants to highlight the EU as well as national climate ambition will be used to spur sustainable economic growth, create jobs, deliver health and environmental benefits for citizens and contribute to the long-term global competitiveness of the economy by promoting innovation in the green technologies. Latvia wants to focus uh, on one important aspect regarding its future energy mix, and this is bioenergy. Biomass plays an important role in Latvian's uh, central heating system. Latvia has well-developed central he heating systems, and uh, we consider that biomass will have substantial role also in future centralized heating systems for the development of efficient use of bioenergy uh, contributes also to the Latvian energy security and rural employment. Wooden building materials used for future zero uh, energy buildings will be useful for cutting emissions in building sector. We think that in the future work, uh, uh, within IRENA should also continue to focus on sustainable use of bioenergy. Latvia welcomes the proposed establishment of a global high-level forum on energy transition, as well as uh, plans to be actively engaged in IRENA long-term energy scenarios network. Uh, thank you. Um, for excellent organization of IRENA online session. In future IRENA events uh, after the pandemic, the possibility to participate also uh, in online should remain. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. I, and I, no, I now give the floor to China. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, climate change is a common challenge that we all face. To combat climate change has become so we have got the ambition as the biggest developing country. Um, there's only 30 years left for us to reach decarbonization and peak our emissions. But this shows our responsibility as a bigger country. According to my um, to National Energy Administration data up to now, uh, we have re uh, we have reached a great uh, success in the installed capacity of renewable energies. So renewable energy development is playing an important role and a very good support for us to decarbonize our economy. We are transitioning our economy and we are building a new uh, format of 
um, development, and we're going to focus on the following. First, we're going to build big scale energy supply system relying on um, renewable energy. We will focus on both centralized and decentralized systems, and we will develop solar and wind um, power generations. By 2030, the installed capacity from solar and wind solar, uh, wind energy will have to reach 1,200 gigawatts. And at the same time, we will develop hydropower, but also reduce the uh, use of coal. Secondly, we're going to improve the quality of energy consumption. We will strictly reduce the um, amount of energy consumption and we will improve energy um, efficiency. We will um, coordinate both supply and the demand size, and we will encourage the development of low carbon economy and the low carbon lifestyle. Certainly, we will improve R and D and innovation, as well as the reduction of costs of uh, renewable technologies. We want to um, improve the flexibility of renewable grid system. So, and we will also um, encourage the development of hydro. Um, and uh, hydrogen, we want to build an integrated system consisting of all sorts of renewable energy sources. Fourthly, we will um, build a system to safeguard the energy system. We want to explore the spot market of energy trading system so that we can make sure that the electricity generated will be utilized and traded. And we also will build a better carbon trading system. For fifthly, we want to share our experiences um, to work together with other countries to share experiences and jointly conduct projects, both bilaterally and multilaterally. At the moment, we are facing unprecedented challenges. Climate change is threatening our virus, very survival. So we want to build um, a co common community for our shared uh, future. And we will work together with the countries to face the challenge. And we want to work together to contribute to the green transition of the world. Thank you. Thank you, China. I now call upon Denmark. Denmark, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, and uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to speak today, uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Denmark stands by its unique ambition to reduce greenhouse gases with 70% by 2030, and renewable energy will play a critical role in achieving this, and already, Last year, we made decisions that will take us one third of the way to that goal. However, that was the easy one third. The next one third will be tougher and the last tougher still. Yesterday, I focused on solutions. Today, I'll try to focus on some of the difficult things that lie ahead. This means looking closely at some of the critical factors such as the societal impact and ensuring that we have a social fair energy transition real challenges that also need some clear answers. One of the things we want to avoid is, of course, that the energy transition and carbon neutrality is seen as a burden that is being opposed instead of an opportunity. Uh, what we would like to see is a bright green future for our people and, and uh, our society. And Denmark's answer to this is try to uh, bring about the energy transition through a whole of community uh, approach. So while we do hope for continued innovation to come up with ever better solutions, we're not going to rely on wonder tech solving all these challenges. Fact is that industrial transition and structural adjustment are difficult processes with perceived winners and losers, regardless of the fact that everyone is better off at the end of the day. Uh, and these inherently political challenges also will then need political answers in order to ensure a stable penetration of carbon neutrality technologies and a carbon neutral society. There's no doubt that achieving this will look very different from, from one country to the next. And in Denmark, we believe in political consensus. This is our way to create the best foundation for long-term planning 
and the investments from government and industry, also when it comes to new technology. So the government is working hard on, on creating that basis. And fortunately, we have seen very wide, broad political consensus behind uh, the Danish energy policies leading us towards carbon neutrality. Innovation will still play a very important role and there is a much need for continued innovation within the renewable energy area. It's changing research results and sharing the innovative edge is a key role for IRENA and one that we believe helps its members plan for success and we believe it should remain a core part of IRENA's work also moving forward. Importantly, innovation is also needed across the energy spectrum. Sometimes we talk a lot about technical or technological innovation, but in fact, we need to look carefully at innovation from production to distribution, services, even sales, uh, because these are kind of new steps that will allow us to make sector coupling and to develop sector coupling generically and hopefully in the most cost effective way. This is the last word on hydrogen. We do believe, the Danish government does believe that hydrogen can play a very important role as part of the solution for heavy transport, for difficult to decarbonize sectors. Denmark is a strong supporter and the Danish government is supporting and investing into this area. Uh, still very much work is needed here. It was made very clear during the industry-wide discussion on hydrogen here at ARENA a few months ago. Uh, Hydrogen has a big potential, but it needs to be supported by the creation of a commercially viable route that will allow the building of a large uh, hydrogen uh, market. And here, certainly, many countries will have to work together to create that foundation and agree on how do we create the best opportunities to have uh, large-scale uh, hydrogen production moving forward. This is what the industry is asking for us. This is what governments need to come up with an answer to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Denmark. And I now call upon Sweden. Sweden, you have the floor. Yes, Sweden. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Ministers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is not news to anybody that the climate is the most, challenge, most important challenge of our time. And while we can do a lot with the technology already available today, research, innovation, and the broad and efficient implementation are of vital importance. New products, technologies, and services will give us more options to meet the challenges in socio-economic efficient ways with clean, cheap, and hopefully efficient solutions. It is obvious that efforts are needed not only regarding technology, but also on research in other areas, such as business models, customer behavior needs, and i.e. crucial social and economic issues. We must make sure that the new energy solutions address the needs and desires also of the users. If an energy solution is not also useful and makes life easier, there will, at the end of the day, be little demand for it. Sweden has a significant national program on energy research and innovation, also in this broader sense, but it is an area where international collaboration is absolutely necessary. Hence, Sweden is engaging actively with the different EU programs, such as the Horizon Europe Framework Program and the Innovation Fund. We do participate actively also in Nordic cooperation and in the different activities of the International Energy Agency. We are also active in the Mission Innovation Initiative and look very much forward to the launch of the second phase of MI 2.0. Let me also finally stress that international cooperation will allow us to tackle far bigger and more complex problems more efficiently. It can and will hopefully also contribute to make new solutions useful for broader global markets. To conclude, research and innovation in international collaborations remain a cornerstone in meeting the global energy and climate challenges. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Sweden. Thank you. Now we have to conclude. We have Austria. Austria, you have just exactly three minutes. That's it. Then we have to conclude. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I want to be very precise on that. 
Uh, first of all, I really want to thank you for dedicating this session um, to the pathway to carbon neutrality. I mean, carbon neutrality was only recently outside the range of vision. And now, and we've heard that from a previous speaker, it's the new normal. As you might know, Austria has committed itself to reach climate neutrality already by 2040. That means 10 years earlier than the EU-wide agreed um, um, time frame. So it's quite clear for us that reaching this ambitious goal would not only require a considerable increase in energy efficiency and share of renewables, it would also require a facilitation of the integration of the energy system. We've heard about um, uh, sector coupling across energy carriers, infrastructures, and end use sectors. Consequently, we need to accelerate the electrification based on renewables, but we also, at the same time, need to promote the use of renewable fuels. We've heard about the electrons, but we also need the mo molecules, uh, in particular hydrogen, and both of them, electrons and molecules, have to stem, have to originate from renewable energy sources. Therefore, uh, the energy system of tomorrow must be characterized by large amounts of renewable energy. And for that, we will need in particular further investments in infrastructure and increased flexibility in the system. Uh, what we are going to do in Austria, we have a national target, not only of climate neutrality by 2040, but also a a target to cover 100% of our national electricity consumption from renewables already in 2030. Uh, that also means we need to install additional renewable electricity uh, production capacity, not less than 27 terawatt hours in, in the next decade. And we are currently finalizing a new Renewable Deployment Act, which will ensure that we have stable conditions also for investors to reach that goal. We also, in that, uh, in, 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 in that law, will tackle hydrogen. We want to, um, we want to ensure uh, adequate investment for renewable hydrogen uh, and fit for purpose regulatory framework. We're doing our homework in Austria, but we are well aware that uh, the future of hydrogen will be global. International cooperation is vital in order to accelerate the growth of renewable hydrogen around the world for that. We need to guarantee common global standards, remove uh, regulatory barriers, and create viable business models for investors. Mr. Chair, I try to stay within the three minutes. And um, thanks so much for sharing thank our experience. You, with you. Thank you. Actually, we are just out of time. Uh, we have requests from a number of countries. I'll uh, try to, with uh, the permission of the director uh, uh, general and permission of the house to extend this by another few minutes. Uh, the United States, you have the floor. Three minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Minister Singh, Director General Francesco Camera, and distinguished delegates. Greetings from the United States. This is a big day for all of us. For today, we talk about green hydrogen and pathway to carbon neutrality. It is both a universal truth and an uninspired energy joke to say that these days hydrogen is everywhere. Hydrogen makes up nearly three quarters of the visible universe, which is about the percentage of times the topic comes up in any conversation about the energy transformation. Hydrogen is an energy technology and green hydrogen in particular has achieved buzzword status. However, of even greater significance is the remarkable amount of financial investment that governments and the private sector are putting toward the technology from innovation to production to distribution. The reasoning is manifest because the potential is enormous. Green hydrogen is seen by many as key to unlocking the significant emission reductions throughout the industrial, transportation, power, and heating sectors. However, like all things when speaking of the energy transfer transformation, green hydrogen needs to be considered in relation to all other elements that form the pathway to carbon neutrality. One must take into consideration a vast network of regulatory and policy related issues of infrastructural and broader physical and social considerations. A green future of green hydrogen will require green returns. 
for while a small but growing amount of low carbon hydrogen is already being produced globally, it is essential that the international community demonstrate leadership. Such leadership from IRENA and IRENA members can enable the large scale efficiency gains needed to expedite the transition from the current state of play to regional and global hydrogen infrastructure, distribution, and markets. But replacing current hydrogen production and applications in industry power transportation and heating with green hydrogen will have to be done not just by displacing incumbent technology, but by economically outcompeting all other zero carbon options. And this is no small task and will inevitably require a system level orientation driven by cross-border cooperation. And here, IRENA can help make an important difference. The price declines we've witnessed in the recent years in solar and wind must take place with green hydrogen if it is to compete in the market. And that competitiveness is determined in large part by continued price declines in renewable energy as we've heard previous speakers talk about. Further, hydrogen presents an opportunity to bolster the economic case for renewable energy projects, justifying renewable energy overbuild and reducing the need to curtail generation when demand is low. Many see green hydrogen becoming cost competitive with blue and gray, gray hydrogen by 2030. Here in the United States, Texas and our Midwestern states already have wind power prices that could make green hydrogen cost competitive closer to 2025, provided the associated structural improvements are also in place. And of course, renewable energy production will need to scale accordingly. Doing so will require and create significant additional revenue flows for renewable energy projects, driving project development costs down even mm -hmm. further, which would in turn make green hydrogen even more competitive. In conclusion, the United States looks forward in the coming weeks, months, and years to work with IRENA membership to pave the way to a future where green hydrogen will compete globally across a range of sectors and help create the just and equitable clean energy future the people of all our lands desire and deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, United States. France, please. France, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if I may, so I will uh, intervene in, uh, in French. Uh, bonjour à tous. Merci beaucoup pour uh, l'organisation uh, de cette session et les discussions. Hello, everyone, and thank you for organizing this session with a very exciting discussion so far. I'd like to thank Mr. Francesco La Camera and Irina Teams for the great quality of this meeting. Coming back to the ambitious policies that we'd like to set up to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, already presented by the Ministry of Ecological Transition, I would like to now stress hydrogen, which is fundamental, as pointed out by your American colleague. Technological, economic, and social innovations are here more and more. Uh, recovery plans for COVID-19 are a source for deploying new solutions and to deeply change our economy and our industrial model. In this context, low carbon hydrogen is innovating and highly promising. It can be used to decarbonize our industry and transportation to stabilize our electricity system. As of 2018, France was one of the first countries to include hydrogen in its national strategy with the wish to deploy uh, French technology. In view of the challenges raised by COVID-19, China has increased its ambitions in low carbon hydrogen. On the 8th of September last, the French Minister of Economy and Finance, Mr. Bruno Le Maire, and Madame Barbara Roby, Minister of the Ecological Transition revealed the new national strategy for hydrogen to invest 7 billion euros in the sector of which 3.4 billion euros in the next three years. This strategy focuses on furthering industrial capacities for low carbon hydrogen with three priorities. First, uh, reduce carbon in high CO2 emitting uh, industries. And secondly, developing heavy 
mobility and supporting research and innovation to develop skills to anticipate as of now on the future uses of hydrogen. Several calls for projects have been launched since October for 625 million euros. Tomorrow, the 21st of January, for the first time, the National Council for Hydrogen France will meet in Paris. The goal will be to structure exchanges between states and stakeholders for implementing the French hydrogen technology, especially in industrial sectors. Furthermore, France considers that the European Union must play a key role in developing these sectors and to develop and national strategies in coordination with the new strategy rolled out by the uh, European Commission this summer. France works, is, works closely with the European Commission and with its European partners. In the last December, it signed with 22 other member states a manifesto for developing a value chain for hydrogen. This is the starting point of a new major project common in Europe to be implemented in 2021. France considers that international cooperation is essential to deploy hydrogen technologies. For example, work in coordination on developing the hydrogen footprint as carried out by the Satisfy European uh, cooperation is essential to ensure the development of low carbon hydrogen. In this context, France is prepared to develop new partnerships on low carbon hydrogen to Irene, Irene in particular. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Now we have run out of time. Uh, we have a number of other requests. I would request those countries to give their written interventions to the Secretariat. And uh, uh, the Director General, Your Excellency, uh, you have the floor. You may respond to all the issues raised. Uh, we are and address all the issues. Thank you, sir. Excellency, Mr. Singh, excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Very many thanks to all our distinguished chair, panelists, speakers, and moderators. This was a very rich and inspiring discussion on a topic of growing importance. And we heard how many countries have made a serious commitment to decarbonizing their economies and many more are actively exploring how to do so. That strong political will is very encouraging and essential if we are to avoid the worst impact of climate change and build resilient, equitable energy systems. It is clear from the discussion that reaching net zero represents a huge challenge, but equally that there are a growing number of options to achieve that. We heard that low cost renewables is the central pillar of those strategies. And there are a wide range of exciting developments underway using renewable electricity and renewable fuels such as green hydrogen. Many speakers emphasize the need for support and the value of international collaboration. We are pleased to hear that many positive comments about IRENA's role to date in supporting just and inclusive energy transitions and the need for IRENA to continue that leadership role aligned with global policy priorities of a sustainable recovery from the pandemic and the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. We will ensure that we take on board the many suggestions speakers have made for further work and deciding the priorities for IRENA's work program. In particular, IRENA's members reaffirmed the lead role of IRENA in the implementation of net zero strategies in line with the Paris Agreement. And in that context, the desire for IRENA to continue to foster close partnerships with countries to develop the roadmaps for deep decarbonization supported by IRENA's continued techno-economic, socio-economic, and policy analysis as a guide for government's decision-making and to promote a just transition. In addition, we heard proposals for IRENA to take a central role 
in building the partnerships needed for development and dissemination of the systemic innovations needed for net zero targets, particularly through the IRENA collaborative frameworks, facilitating an inclusive public-private action agenda focused on solutions, including high share of renewable power and the growing use of green hydrogen. Ladies and gentlemen, net zero is clearly a huge challenge and requires rapid and sustained action on multiple fronts. However, the innovation and determination of that policymakers and businesses showed in today's discussion gives me confidence that by working together, we can deliver our goals. Thank you very much. Uh, the conductor, Mrs. Singh. Uh, because of the paucity of time, uh, we could not hear interventions from um, some countries, uh, Antigua and Barbuda, Fiji, Italy, Japan, Philippines, and Colombia. We apologize uh, because uh, for the paucity of time. We could not accommodate your request to speak. We request you to give your remarks in writing to the ARENA Secretariat, and your remarks will be included in the official records. I thank all the speakers. I uh, must say that this session has been most enlightening. We have all benefited from it. And I would like to thank especially the IRENA Secretariat for having organized uh, these discussions. These discussions have really been uh, very useful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. The India will report back to the plenary on the 21st of January on these important discussions that we have had today. Thank you very much. Hmm? Of uh, this concludes our consideration of the ministerial plenary meeting on renewables and pathways to carbon neutrality, innovation, green hydrogen, and socioeconomic policies. Thank you.